So, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you at this uh, afternoon session. We'll have a number of uh, very interesting and technical talks that I'm looking forward to. And uh, we'll start with uh, Lukas Heitmanek, and he'll be talking about the Kubernetes service at uh, InfraCZ. So, Lukas, floor is yours. Please go ahead. Noon. Uh, my name is Lukáš Heitmanek, I am IT architect at uh, Centrum Charitasi at uh, Masaryk University and my today talk will be about our uh, container platform Kubernetes uh, that is available in uh, joint activity of uh, infrastructure. Uh, our Kubernetes platform basically offers uh, three kind of uh, services or use cases that uh, the ordinary user can, can use. The first one is uh, Rancher application, which is a web interface to, to the Kubernetes. And uh, this interface offers application catalogs uh, from which uh, the user can select prepared application and run it just clicking on a web user interface. Uh, the second uh, services uh, are offered through web applications. Uh, it means that those applications are running in Kubernetes and are exposed as a web, uh, web application, basically agnostic to the Kubernetes platform at all. And the last one is native Kubernetes API that can be used uh, to deploy own application. And in the next slide, I will talk ab about uh, these three uh, offered services. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we use the Rancher UI, and this UI offers uh, so-called catalogs of applications. Mostly, those applications are based on a um, graphical user interface. It means that uh, the user can run something that has either a web interface or uh, any, any other mean of uh, a graphical user interface, such as VNC. Uh, Maybe the most notable are uh, ANSYS, uh, MATLAB, RStudio, or generic desktops, or VMD uh, molecular uh, viewer. Uh, another um, group of applications is uh, Code Server or PyCharm. So with the, uh, those two, you can basically do uh, um, remote development uh, using our Kubernetes. And the Lastly, edit uh, application is uh, text uh, interface to a large uh, language model that uh, one user re requested it and we prepared package, integrated it into, into Rancher and using a single form you can run such application. So how to use it? You can log uh, to Rancher Cloud Infra CZ. You select cluster applications and chart, and you will see similar form as those displayed on the slide. You fill resources or any, any other options that are uh, in. And just note here, you usually need to fill all the options that are offered, otherwise it won't work. And unfortunately, the Rancher UI is not able to force you to fill everything needed. So just be careful to fill everything. And then you can run install and application should be running. Then you can navigate to service and, show, and you will see the endpoint that you sh should connect to. For more information, you can visit the link below, docsherit.io, that describes uh, how to run those applications with uh, arrows and, uh, and screenshots and how to exactly run it. Also, if you are missing some application that you would like to see we add to the rancher, don't hesitate and request that you want that or another. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the users requested the uh, user interface to large language models, so we added the application and the user is happy to, to run it from, from the rancher. So that was the one of the, f of the three fields that we offer. The second one is web, uh, our web applications. It means that uh, we run Kubernetes and, and uh, in Kubernetes we run some, some application that has a native web user interface. Uh, main three I would like to mention uh, are Jupyter Hub, AlphaFold, and CryoSpark. 
it doesn't mean that we build those applications. Those are ordinary applications you can, you can download, and some of them are already prepackaged to run in, the, in, in Kubernetes, some are not. So the first one is Jupyter Hub. Uh, the first link is where you can find it. Uh, it's integrated with uh, infra CZX storages. Uh, also, we have integration with uh, one data data set. Right, Adrian? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, the, um, one of the advantages uh, with uh, our Jupyter Hub is that uh, those notebooks are running without explicit time limit. So uh, the notebook is not killed, say, after some time period, but we closely watch the activity of the notebook and if we have, uh, if we think that the notebook is done, is, uh, um, does nothing, then we kill it. Uh, the user is uh, informed uh, via mail, I think three times in advance that the, the notebook has no activity and will be killed if the activity is not resumed. Uh, if the notebook is using GPU, then the policy is uh, more strict because uh, GPU are uh, scarce resources. We have also a number of prepared images, but again, as uh, in the case with uh, Rancher application, if you are missing some image that you would like to use in a Jupyter Hub, just ask and we, we add such image. Currently, beside standard Jupyter notebooks, we also support uh, prepared image with RStudio, also MATLAB, so we can run a whole MATLAB application via Jupyter Hub. It has native support from the creators of the MATLAB. And the another example is RSAT uh, image uh, that was requested from some, by some user from University of Palackského in Olomouc. Uh, from uh, from notebook, you can also spawn new jobs. So uh, you have you don't need anything special. Basically, you can access uh, Kubernetes API di directly from the notebook. The uh, authentication is established once you have the notebook, and you you are free to run additional jobs. But you actually need to, to know how to run the job. It's a bit difficult, but if you overcome this obstacle, you are free to, to run jobs in the background from the notebook. And for advanced users, we offer a binder hub. That's, uh, it is the tool to, that also builds the actual notebook image from the source. And uh, compared to public instances of binder hub, we uh, extend it so that uh, user can request resources such as CPU, GPU, or memory. So you can request how much of those resources you need to run that uh, binder hub uh, notebook. Uh, this is example of uh, the initial form for the Jupyter notebook. You can see that there is uh, some of uh, documentation in line that uh, describes what to do and uh, what can you select. Uh, the form is not complete here, of course. It's, uh, it continues below, but uh, I don't have the screen here. And uh, also we run uh, some custom instances of the Jupyter Hub for, um, for some interest groups, such as, such as for the Technical University of Liberec, for instance. And this instance is uh, customized to the needs of the particular group, such as a simplified form or a press select only particular images and so on. So again, if, uh, if you, uh, you are a member of such group and need would or would like to utilize custom instance of the Jupyter Hub, just request and we can, we can prepare. Uh, another application that has a web uh, interface is uh, AlphaFold. We create, this is our own application, we created user interface for AlphaFold tools, as uh, those seem to be uh, a bit tricky to use to fill all the required parameters. Uh, currently, we support several different tools already, such as AlphaFold, ColabFold, OmegaFold, ESMFold. All those tools are integrated into one single user interface. Uh, as speaking about Collapfold, we are running our own MM uh, server 
which means that if you want to run the computation in collab fault, you are hitting no uh, rate limit of the public uh, collab fault server with database. And uh, lastly, we added a possibility to limit number of models for collab fault because there were some users that uh, run a really big uh, computation for maybe really big proteins the, when the computation would took like half of year to finish all the models. So we added possibility to just request one model that can be finished like in two months or something like that. That is a huge amount of time as well, but they are happy to wait for some reason. <laughs> and the uh, Collab Fault application is integrated with Molstar Viewer that is developed on at Masaryk University on KTEC and with e infra <coughs> storage, uh, but not valve. It means that the result of the computation are automatically stored into home, into some directory of um, uh, um, infra storage. And this is how it looks like. It's, uh, uh, it's the initial form where you are re required to fill in the protein sequences and all other uh, fields can be set as they are and just run the computation, it starts the job in the ground and you are notified via mail that uh, the computation has finished. And once it's finished, you can directly view the result in, in the web UI using some 3D PyMol viewer. And you, all, um, you can also use the Molstar link that is shown below the uh, button with the open, open link. And the last one of, of the noted uh, web application is CryoSpark. That's of course not our application. It's a worldwide used uh, application for analyzing uh, CryoSpark uh, electron microscopy. But the web user interface is currently running, running in Kubernetes. We developed some wrappers uh, so that the CryoSpark can run the jobs uh, in Kubernetes. And actually, we prepare a setup so that the CryoSpark can run the job to both uh, Kubernetes and also PBS system. And uh, it's packaged into, into Helm package, so the new instances can be easily added. But uh, of course, uh, own license is required for, for the user that would like to request new instance. And currently, we have like uh, six instances of, of the CryoSpark running for various groups. This is a screenshot from, from the CryoSpark for, for instance. And the last part was uh, native uh, Kubernetes API and how can it be used and what can you do with, with it. Uh, first, you, the user needs to get kubeconfig from Rancher UI. So you lock, lock into the Rancher and uh, uh, using some uh, icon you can download uh, kubeconfig. And then you can either deploy a so-called Helm, Helm package, which is prepackaged application to run in Kubernetes. It is in a form of a template. You need to fill, fill custom values. As I have told, it's a template. So using those values, you just customize the templates to your needs. Such for, for instance, you can fill it uh, how much resources you need and so on, or a host name. And below are a few examples how to how to install some package uh, via Helm into your namespace, uh, issuing values and so on. Uh, the second possibility is to deploy Docker image, which is a commonly requested task. Uh, the user are asking, I have uh, I found actually Docker image and how can I run it? Then okay, this is a bit. Uh, difficult for, for the beginners. But once you have the Docker image, you need to create the so-called deployment manifest. And if it is, uh, so if it is uh, some network application that has either a user interface or listens on some network ports, then of course you need to create also service manifest, which is either a load balancer or cluster IP. The cluster IP is for web application. And for web application, you need to create the third manifest, which is called ingress. The ingress will expose your application to the internet in case it is a web application. 
And uh, if you are just some custom or a raw protocol, then uh, the service of type, lo of, uh, type load balancer is enough to, to expose the application. So exposing the web application to the internet, it means that you create uh, deployment and service and ingress. And uh, Kubernetes infrastructure can issue Lex Encrypt certificate for you if you want. And also uh, it can create ad hoc DNS name for your application. So you have basically right after deployment your application exp uh, exposed at uh, some more or less pretty DNS name with uh, certificate. You can also expose a raw application. It means that you deploy only deployment and service. As I mentioned, it has to be a uh, load balancer type. And it can be exposed at particular IP. Also, you can get ad hoc DNS name in the domain DIN Cloud e Infra CZ. Also, you can, uh, you can get a Lex Encrypt certificate uh, if you request one. And also, in this case, you do not have to take care about reissuing the new certificate. The Kubernetes infrastructure does it for you automatically. And another example is that in the case of raw application, you are basically allowed to run some container with, uh, for example, SSH uh, server. And you can use SSH protocol to log into your instance or running container. Um, and now some tips for, for this difficult part. Uh, basically, how to run Docker image that expect to be run as root because the infrastructure is managed and shared. You are not allowed uh, currently to run containers as uh, under a root account. But mostly root privileges are not necessary. Basically, one, there are few cases that are used uh, that um, root privileges are required. One of uh, them is that you want to modify the running image, but this is actually anti-pattern of using containers. You should have uh, the image uh, prepared in the way you want to use it. So it means basically not to install additional packages. You should rebuild, rebuild the image in such a case. Uh, well, you can, you can have image uh, that contains some directories for, uh, say, logs or any, any uh, other, other, tem uh, other temporary files. And uh, in such case, you can actually mount empty their volume in, into those directories so they are uh, writable. And uh, maybe the third case where would you need uh, root access is that you want to run application that run that listens uh, at a specified port and the port is below 1024 but this is not actually required for kubernetes because there is uh, port remapping via service so you can still expose your application for instance uh, at uh, http or https ports but the actually uh, actual application is running on higher ports so you have no problem and uh, no um, there is no need for uh, root uh, privileges uh, and uh, also if you have the image that is such that is uh, uh, built uh, in such a way that it uh, actually seems to require uh, root privileges because it wants to uh, write everywhere in the container, then you can basically easily rebuild the image that you use the following uh, Docker, Im Docker image uh, prescription where you basically copy all the files from the original image to a new one and uh, during the copy you change uh, ownership of all the files and then you run at the same under the same user and in this case you can freely modify the whole container while it is running unfortunately this docker file does not uh, work with uh, kaneko builder but they are workarounds and also such the new image does not inherit any variables from the original one such as environment work there and so on so for those of you are uh, that are familiar with uh, docker images that's just uh, something to note and uh, we also created some <laughs> little trick how to allow to install additional packages to running container. 
uh, you can rebuild the image as above and install fake root utility. And if you simlink the fake root utility to sudo, you are actually have working sudo in the running container. It's just cosmetic thing. You don't not, you don't uh, gain actually uh, root privileges, but uh, tools like uh, the PKG or apt uh, they are believe you are actually root and allow you to install anything you want because the files are owned by your users, so you are allowed to write, and everything is working. Uh, and here I have uh, two common problems that you can. Uh, see when you are trying to run some um, containers uh, in our platform. The first one is uh, warning that uh, basically your manifest does not have uh, proper security context. And at the link below, you can you can read how the context exactly has to look like. You, so you do not see such warning because those that warning is actually a hard error and the container won't start for you. And the second one is related to the first. It also um, means that you are missing uh, proper security context, but this can be caused by the image itself because uh, some of the uh, Docker image creators uh, say, um, say a statement user and the following is name, not the user ID. And if user with name is used, then the Kubernetes does not or cannot check that the name is not the UID zero, then it uh, refuses to start, but uh, it has a trivial fix. You can add, uh, run as user directly to the deployment or just uh, set a user with a numeric ID to the Docker, Docker image when you rebuild it, rebuild it. And that's all from me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so, are there any questions? Uh, we have some questions online, but uh, if we have any questions here from the audience, uh, I don't see, so I will take the questions here. Uh, can we install ANSYS student version in Rancher? Uh, to possibility to inc is there a possibility to increase a DPI frame rate? So these are two questions. First question, can we install ANSYS student version on Rancher? And second question is, is there a possibility to increase the resolution, basically, and the frame rate for, uh, I guess, GUI applications? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it is possible to, to add a new version of ANSYS, but uh, if I understand correctly, then uh, Metacentrum does not have all the licenses, licenses for, for the new version. Uh, I think that full licenses are only for 2018 version and the newer are missing some of them. But of course, we can, we can provide the latest uh, ANSYS version that is used in Metacentrum so that um, both, uh, both access are the same, actually. And uh, as of the increase of uh, resolution, it may be just uh, contact us and say exactly what is what is needed uh, because uh, well for vnc it, it's a bit tricky to, to deal with resolution and for uh, webrtc interface uh, it is a limitation of gpu cards that the resolution cannot be higher than it than it actually is all right, uh, thank you. There is another question. While using multiple cores in PyCharm, taking, t taking more time than, simple c than single core, how to optimize it? Uh, we are using MPI for distribution of the job. <laughs> it seems to be a long... Yeah, that's... Yeah, while using multiple cores in PyCharm, I guess uh, it is taking more time than when they use single core. How to optimize it? And they are using MPI. Is there, is there a more to this question? Can, if I click this? No, I, I, I mean, we, we see all the text, right? Okay. I'm not sure if I understand the question. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, if we don't understand the question, we'll probably not take it. But okay. uh, uh, before we continue, maybe I'll ask a question. So uh, you 
the, we, we had a, we had a talk uh, in the morning about the OpenStack cloud service. Now we had the talk about the Kubernetes service. What what is your advice? When when should users uh, use OpenStack and when Kubernetes? What are the advantages of one over another, and in what what circumstances? Uh, okay, from my point of view, when the user have uh, or wants uh, full control of the running machine, the, like uh, maintaining and administrating also the operating system, and mostly the, and importantly, the user has the capability to do so because it's not quite common actually, then uh, the, maybe the best way for such uh, experienced user is to use a virtual machine and fully control the application. But, but um, um, it needs to be said that uh, the line where the, say, administrators are responsible for the infrastructure uh, is at uh, operating system level. Below the operating system level with OpenStack, it's up to administrators, and above it's full, uh, in the respons full responsibility is uh, uh, at, the, at the user. Uh, with Kubernetes, the administrators are responsible for more things, such as mentioned uh, certificates, integration with storages, and uh, basically the user should uh, maintain and deal only with the uh, Docker image and the actual application. Anything else should be provided by infrastructure. Thank you for the answer. And uh, maybe an additional question. Is Kubernetes meant uh, today morning it was said that uh, the OpenStack uh, services are great uh, whenever you need to kind of sort of have a, uh, an application or a, or a computation running deployed kind of indefinitely where you return to it uh, basically running a service. Uh, Kubernetes, uh, what you discussed, uh, seems to be very much the same or, or kind of a similar direction. Is Kubernetes useful or do you see it as useful for running batch jobs? Actually, yes, because we already demonstrated uh, that uh, Nextflow, for instance, Nextflow Work Manager is able to run in Kubernetes, and one uh, or maybe two actually groups uh, in at CTEC at Masaryk University are running Nextflow pipelines uh, through Kubernetes basically at a daily basis. And we also created, uh, uh, well, one accepted public publication or paper last year that compared running uh, Nextflow uh, at Kubernetes and Nextflow in PBS. The result was uh, that it is the same. There is no performance penalty. We, uh, we as admins need to set up the system properly, of course. It's not, not by the way, but uh, when properly set up, the performance is the same and we had another paper that was unfortunately not accepted where we showed that the, that the penalty or overhead of the containers and Kubernetes is less than half of the percent in compared to bare metal. Thank you. Uh, so last one, one last little question. So uh, in uh, when we run the OpenStack, there is a typical practice that there is over provisioning of the nodes or of the cores that uh, multiple virtual cores are hosted by a single physical core. How is it in in Kubernetes in the installation yeah. that we run here? Is there uh, over provisioning or are we running bare metal basically? We are running bare metal installation of Kubernetes. So there is no over provisioning between the host, bare metal host and the Kubernetes, but your application or any running container can be over provisioned because you can request the actual number of cores you want and uh, a higher limit of cores that you are actually limited to use. So you can uh, like request half of the CPU core and actually set limit that uh, you are burstable load that can uh, run up to four CPUs. So you are allowed to this and it means that basically the infrastructure is actually over provisioned a bit in Thank such you. a case. Thank you very much. So if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Martin Golasowski from IT for Innovations.
and Martin will be uh, talking about uh, an, about our approach, HPC as a service uh, and uh, and distributed data management solution. So Martin, please go ahead. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I will just uh, set it up. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. My name is Martin Glasovsky. I'm with IT for Innovations, and uh, I'll be talking about the Lexis platform as a solution to the HPC as a service and distributed data management uh, uh, features which uh, we provide uh, to our users. So uh, I think that uh, one of the uh, key points of, the, uh, of this approach is that there are many users uh, which uh, do not uh, want to access the HPC directly. They don't know much about the Linux environment, and they don't want to work in the terminal, uh, uh, in the terminal environment, and so on. But uh, they have uh, uh, they have uh, uh, quite complicated uh, compute workflows. They want to run uh, complicated chains of applications on both HPC and cloud. They have uh, uh, huge data they want to process on a, on a powerful computing resources, and. Uh, for that, uh, we built a platform which is exposed as an API, which the users can use to launch their workflows and uh, upload and download the data. And uh, this uh, platform, this API, basically allows them to uh, run uh, very complex uh, applications on both HPC clusters and cloud. Uh, and uh, on top of this API, we also built a graphical user interface, so the users don't have to access the terminal at all. Um, uh, the key features of the platform is, of course, the orchestration of the workflows across uh, uh, multiple uh, HPC clusters or cloud resources at the same time. Uh, then we also offer distributed data management uh, through, uh, through IROTS and uh, uh, metadata index based on Elasticsearch. Uh, it's... Mm -hmm. Sorry? I'm blinking, right? All right. Try it like this. How about now? Will it stay? Okay. So, uh, the distributed data management, this is a very important feature because uh, the part of the workflow execution should be also automatic data movement uh, between the HPC uh, resource and some external object storage or external um, services. And uh, of course, we provide uh, easy access to these uh, features uh, through web portal, which is also connected to, uh, to let's say, big uh, identity federations, uh, which is B2 access and my access ID, and it's off again, fortunately. So I'll try a different port. about this, okay. So, important points are the, <laughs> it's black screen, okay. Okay, maybe we should continue with the PDF. Right, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, important point is uh, the, uh, connect uh, the, the connection to the two uh, European federations of uh, identities, b 2 access and my access ID, which means that you can use your uh, institutional login to access the platform, or also social networks and so on. And uh, this is a basic implementation of the HPS as a service approach uh, which unifies the API across uh, very different uh, computational resources across uh, Europe. So, um, uh, we've been busy uh, last year. Uh, we implemented a lot of uh, updates in the platform. We have a new logo. 
we somehow uh, released uh, or worked on a uh, Lexis uh, platform version 2. And uh, the main highlight is uh, the integration of a new orchestrator, which is based on Apache Airflow. Uh, we uh, implemented completely new front end uh, from the ground up. Uh, we uh, enhanced uh, and reworked uh, the backend database scheme, which also allowed us to uh, create an improved uh, airbag uh, metrics uh, with very fine grade permissions. And uh, we also extended uh, the, let's say, portfolio of connecting locations, uh, apart from the IT4I clusters, Carolina, Carolina and Barbara and so on, uh, also to Lumi. Uh, we have also a uh, private HPC cluster behind the VPN, uh, which means that we can also accommodate to various different situations where uh, when the HPC clusters are isolated uh, from public access. Uh, then we connected Cineca, Leonardo and, and Galileo. We also uh, work on uh, uh, being connected to the Puchti cluster operated by CSC. Then uh, we also uh, connected the EPCC uh, location with, the, with our Cirrus clus uh, cluster and uh, small cluster at LRZ and working on connection to the uh, terabyte platform uh, at uh, DLI. Uh, so uh, the architecture of this whole solution looks like this. Uh, on the top, uh, maybe it, yeah, it works like this. On the top, uh, you see the, mm, uh, uh, the, the Lexis portal, which uh, I will show later uh, on a live demo, hopefully, uh, which uh, provides, uh, let's say, easy access to all the different features of the platform. Then in the middle, we have a Lexus platform core, which is operated at the moment by IT4i. Uh, and it consists of uh, several services. So there is, a, of course, the API proxy. And two big uh, uh, services in the middle are the distributed data infrastructure core, which hosts uh, a metadata index uh, based on Elasticsearch, and the service uh, which orchestrates the data movement across different locations. Then we also have a uh, instance of a key cloak, which uh, provides uh, the uh, connection between the MyAccess ID and the UDAT as an authentication proxy. And this is the point which uh, issues uh, the uh, tokens uh, for our APIs and for our users. And uh, the, the box here on the right, it's a workflow management orchestrator uh, service, which uh, is based uh, on the Apache Airflow, and we built a uh, let's say a set of custom operators uh, and uh, and providers uh, which talk to our custom APIs to control the data movement and the, and the HPC job management. Uh, then uh, on the bottom you see a bunch of different HPC sites. The, the purple parts here are the integration components which are supposed to be deployed on each of the sites. So we have the uh, we have the HPS, HPC as a service REST API, which provides us mapping between the, let's say, common AI domain operated here by the Cloak and the local um, local HPC accounts. For that, uh, we uh, ask the centers to issue us uh, uh, something we call personalized robot accounts, which are tied to a certain allocation <laughs> of a compute time on target location, and uh, also the uh, the, uh, the HIPI basically uh, runs externally to the, to the clusters, so we are not trying to force the centers to change anything with the clusters. We are trying to operate on a, on a, in a user, user space. And then the uh, distributed data infrastructure area is a basically a set of uh, processes which orchestrate the data movement bet between the different remote IROD zones and also uh, some external repositories here on the right. And uh, there is a asynchronous uh, staging worker which accepts uh, tasks from a centralized point, but I will talk about this uh, later. About the user interfaces, uh, we provide, apart from the web portal, we provide also um, a classical REST API, which is documented here using the Open API standard. We also provide a, a Python SDK, Python library, which also contains the terminal-based interface if there is a still user which wants to use those kind of uh, interfaces, uh, for example, for automation and so on. So uh, this is the kind of interfaces we are trying to provide for our users. Now something about the uh, staging API, uh, how it works. So uh, basically this uh, right uh, part here is the part which is usually deployed on a target HPC center. Uh, we, uh, the, the, the center, uh, uh, has to mandatory deploy this uh, staging worker 
which is a basically salary worker to, uh, to those of you who know the Python ecosystem. And optionally, the uh, HPC Center can also deploy uh, IROT zone. And this is uh, used as a main channel to transfer the data between different locations, but optionally, the staging worker can also connect directly to the IROTs, remote IROT zones and leverage those parallel uh, data transfers the IROTs protocol offers. And uh, then the staging worker also talks to the HP and facilitates the movement of the data between these external locations to the uh, HPC cluster storage using the typical interfaces which are available like RSync, SFTP, SCP, and so on. And on the, on the left, this is the part which runs in the platform core, and this is uh, quite typical REST API, which uses the Celery framework to issue, um, issue tasks uh, in this uh, broker, and uh, individual workers deployed in, in the each center are listening on a, on a, on a queue, on a tasks queue uh, here, and, uh, and then uh, uh, start uh, basically or facilitate the data movement between the uh, resources uh, specified by the request. So this API is also used by the uh, by the orchestrator. Okay, no. um, then uh, something about the ex uh, workflow execution model, how it actually works. So if you log into the uh, to the platform, you can uh, either use uh, your own obtainer or singularity containers mm, and uh, let the platform uh, execute them on your selected on the selected HPC cluster. Or you can use uh, something we call hippie templates, which are basically templates for the job scripts, which you, uh, which, which you know very well. And uh, those uh, templates allow us to basically tweak some uh, special parameters which may be needed by some HPC applications. Or if you need something uh, really special, some very complex workflow, we can create it uh, for you. We call it custom workflow deck and we use it, for example, in a, one of the projects used, uh, which is using the platform. This is the Everest project. And uh, this, um, uh, the, the, this use case uh, is uh, running uh, uh, weather forecasts, which are executed on a HPC cluster every day. And we use that, uh, for that we use the uh, Apache Airflow scheduler and also uh, uh, the, yeah, the Apache workflow scheduler. And uh, this deck is producing basically fresh uh, uh, weather forecast uh, every day and uploads them to the external resource. Then uh, once uh, you select uh, the, uh, the source of your template, of your workflow template, then you create a workflow instance here uh, where you select the target allocation and resource and you specify whether you want to use the data hand handling, data staging features exposed by the platform or not, or some default execution time parameters, and then you create uh, the execution of the workflow itself and then the orchestrator will take over and start running the tasks uh, as uh, specified uh, in, the, in the DAC, the workflow, and it, it can produce the resource data sets and you also you can access logs. Uh, then uh, in the platform, in order to accommodate the different ways how the uh, compute times are allocated across Europe, we implemented this resource abstraction model. So uh, the, the big blue uh, boxes uh, on the top level are the different providers, the different sites which are operating the, the resources like uh, CSC or IT4I uh, in our case, for example. Then in the, uh, the, the, the lighter box in the middle, is the actual resource, is the, uh, is the allocation of the compute uh, time itself, which uh, has a principal inv investigator, which is the, the user who requested, uh, submitted the proposal uh, for, the, for the compute time, for the allocation. And uh, the allocation can, uh, has uh, different uh, resources inside, for example, uh, partition, CPU partition on Barbora, or uh, some uh, cloud credits, for example, or some storage allocation at IT4i. And uh, this abstraction allows uh, you know, us to associate those different resources with the so-called Lexus project. So this is the unit uh, in uh, which uh, you work uh, in with our platform. And uh, this uh, Lexus project, we can request uh, to have some, comp uh, some compute time allocation to be associated. And the users of the project can basically use it directly. Uh, then I have selected uh, some use cases. Um, mm, I think the, uh, the, the highlights uh, are the Ligate project and the openwebsearch.eu. So the Ligate project uh, is a project which has a use case uh, with an application for a molecular docking simulation. And this application has uh, some private IP inside, so the binary and uh, 
the source code cannot be exposed to any external users, but at the same time, the company which owns the IP, Dompe, wants to expose this application to some external users. So they uh, use the Lexis platform to actually expose uh, workflow with this application to some external users, uh, and uh, they can uh, uh, run this application, specify its parameters, and so on, uh, upload their own input data without the direct access to the binary or the source code. This is uh, thanks to the uh, separation of the, uh, of the application using the hippie command templates and the orchestrator. And then also we have a, uh, another European, European project called openwebsearch.eu, and uh, this project uh, focuses on creating an open European web index, um, and uh, it uh, uses the Lexis workflows uh, to process uh, the, or generate the, the indexes from uh, uh, crawled data from the open public internet on several HPC locations. And uh, also they are using the Lexis API and the uh, front end to expose those uh, generated index to the external users. Uh, so this is another good use case of this platform. Also, we would like to offer the platform to you, uh, to, to users. If you want to use our platform, we are opening this version two for early adopters. Uh, let's say access. If you want to use our platform, please go to our login, uh, to our portal and log in there at portal.lexis.tech. You can use one of those two European federations. Uh, then uh, if you want to run some computations, uh, obtain some allocation on either IT4I or some other connected uh, resource um, uh, through various channels, through the national uh, national call or through the EuroHPC calls, for example, create your Lexis project and request connection of your allocation to the Lexis project through those uh, buttons. Or if you have any general question, if you want to use Lexis, just contact us at uh, support at lexis.tech. So, this would be the early adopters. And now I would like to talk uh, a little bit about uh, some future of the Lexis platform, how you would like to extend it. Um, and this is uh, within the context of the Exa4Mine. This is a project uh, which uh, started uh, last year, and it for is a coordinator of the project. It's one of the Horizon Europe projects. It's called Extreme Analytics for Mining Data Spaces. And uh, the focus of this project is to bring uh, uh, application cases uh, which have a very complex and uh, or, a, or a huge data in terms of petabytes and uh, they would like to use the uh, supercomputing centers to process the data either for AI, uh, for, uh, for uh, let's say molecular docking and uh, so on. And the typical problem with uh, our application cases is that uh, they have a very complicated uh, data structure and they will require uh, several different uh, data structures in order to even index the data. And sometimes the HPC will be used just to generate the index. And for that, uh, we are planning to build something called Extreme Data Database, which will essentially extend this concept of the uh, Lexis staging and data movements uh, with uh, the possibility to also use uh, traditional database uh, management systems and object stores and some novel data interfaces which are uh, out there, and of course, uh, we plan to extend here also connections to the uh, to the UDAT EOSC itself and the planned European uh, data spaces initiatives. Uh, so this is the exa for mind, and uh, here is the illustration of uh, what I just described. That uh, basically this uh, left part is uh, what we already uh, implemented and and refreshed in uh, in Lexis in last year, and also uh, what we would like to. Uh, explore and extend here in exa for mind uh, basically possibilities to have more complex indexes, not just uh, plain, plain old elastic search, but uh, also some more complicated indexes and uh, to have a possibility to uh, use uh, different uh, data APIs. So uh, this would be it. Now uh, this is a list of uh, uh, projects and partners which are using the platform or we are uh, collaborating uh, with them. Uh, now I would like to try to uh, show some live demo, if, uh, if possible, if it will, if the connection will hold. Let's, let's see. Yep. Let's see how, how long will it last. So uh, the, the demo will be focused on basically running a very simple, yeah. That's true, that's true. A resolution. So let me try. 
So we have the displays. Hmm? Sorry? Sixty. Mm, it's just sixty. Mm -mm. So maybe let's try this one. It's the ATP sixty. It stayed like this. Will it stay? <laughs> Nope. All right. Menchi? Extended, yeah. Uh -huh. Task kidney running. A tady dáme 60. Mám menchi třeba? Takhle. Jo. All right. OK, so let's try to do it that way. I don't know which side it was on. Resolutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe let's let's try to do it uh, somehow quickly. I will try to show how a very simple Python AI container can be run in our platform. So there is a repository with a Python script which uh, uses ResNet to do some very basic inference, and we have a, we have an obtainer recipe here, and the obtainer recipe can be used to generate a SIF file. Those of you who are familiar with the obtainers, then it can be used to uh, generate a small file uh, which contains the, your entire application. Then you can go to uh, to the Lexis platform, uh, to the portal. Uh, here you can uh, click on the login page and use one of the federations we have here. So I'm going to use my access ID and uh, use uh, the uh, VSB uh, university login like that. Yeah, this is it. Uh, at the beginning, I see there is a there is a dashboard of uh, all the workflows I have uh, run. Uh, I'm I'm uh, showing you a project which we use uh, as a as a demo uh, for various purposes. And uh, in the menu here on the left, uh, there is a uh, there is a little of different dashboards you can uh, use to watch the operations going on in a platform. Then you can work with the data sets. You can use the um, the uploads data sets to uh, work with the data sets uh, you as a user uploaded. And there is also, there is also this uh, wizard which you can use to actually directly upload the data to the platform using your browser. Or if you have bigger data, you can use also clients which uh, we provide, uh, which, which I uh, showed uh, uh, earlier. Or you can also use uh, directly the iRoots uh, client if necessary. Then we have uh, some other categories of data sets, uh, workflows are data sets generated by the workflows as a result. And here you can also see the parts of the open web, deck, web index, which is uh, generated uh, almost uh, daily. And this uh, particular data set is stored in uh, Germany in uh, LRZ in the IROT zone uh, hosted by, by them. Um, so the most important uh, uh, menu item here is the applications here. Uh, those three items describe the three different ways how to actually create the workflows in our platform. We also work on a way, uh, on a declarative uh, approach to defining our workflows, uh, which will be based on a Tosca standard, uh, which uses YAML files. Uh, but uh, we are uh, we didn't expose this feature yet to our uh, users, but we are getting there. Uh, if you want to uh, upload your container, then you go to the containers menu here, here, and uh, you can click on create container and use the um, wizard basically to upload your file uh, with your container and the icon and fill some metadata. But I have already uploaded the container there, which it's called uh, this animals AI example. What it does, it really does a very simple inference using CPU, using a bunch of 
uh, images of, uh, of, uh, of uh, animals that tries to determine what kind of animal is there. So when I click on this container, I can create a, uh, I can create a workflow uh, and uh, it will appear basically here in this list of uh, workflows, which is another top level menu, yeah, menu, uh, menu item. Uh, I already created some of the uh, one of the workflows uh, for this purposes. So we have a workflow called live demo, which is what we do. If I want to run this entire workflow, I go to executions. And hopefully the internet will stay. Then we have the live demo effect, of course. Yeah, now. So this is the list of executions. Uh, if I want to run it, I, I click on create workflow execution, define some, uh, some arbitrary name. Here I can select the input data set I have uploaded before. Uh, I uploaded a bunch of uh, uh, basically animal images here uh, and some annotations in CSV files. Here, this field I can use to pass the parameters to my container if, if needed. I will fill in the parameters which are required by this one. This is just for illustration. It should have a, it should have a uh, default uh, value. Yeah, and here I can also set uh, some uh, metadata for the output data set generated and some, uh, let's say, parameters of the HPC job uh, itself, like number of cores and so on, wall time. So I click here on create and then the, uh, the, the orchestrator will take over and so the, uh, the, the tasks here will start to uh, change the colors like this can see that uh, there are two branches here uh, for data transfers. For example, this branch transfers the actual container to the HPC cluster. This branch transfers the, the, the input data set and uh, it converges here before the HIPI submit job. But this is a call to our HIPI middleware which actually submits the job. And uh, this uh, part uh, waits uh, for the job to be, uh, to be finished. Yeah, we are uh, getting out of time, so I will quickly just show how the successful run uh, looks like. Uh, for example, I can go to logs of this HIPI job waiting task and I can view the uh, output of the container which has been produced on the, on the cluster, which can be visible, for example, here. This is the STD out and STD error of the, of the HPC job. And uh, also I can view the uh, data set it produced like this. Yeah output data set and I can see the listing of the files it produced. It should produce one CSV file with some uh, predicted uh, labels. And I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much. Maybe time for questions. Uh, we have time for maybe one quick question. Uh, I do not see the question from the auditorium. Mm -hmm. well, we also yep. don't have the questions online. So thank you once again. And uh, let's thank the speaker again. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Alex, Alex Kšenek from Cessnet. Uh, Alex will be talking about the graphical interfaces available at uh, Metacentrum. So, Alex, uh, floor is yours. Yeah, there is, should be a virtual pointer working. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to speak about the graphical environments in uh, Metacentrum. And the first slide is uh, a scientific simulation, how it is seen in, in a movie. And I like this particular one because this, uh, the guys here found out that something is going wrong in Yellowstone. 
So they say, okay, let's make a simulation what is going there. And they, they just put in the, all, all the data, or the surface deformation, uh, CFD models of the <coughs> magma movement underneath and the atmospheric models uh, above. It takes about 20 seconds. And then they found out that in a couple of hours the whole Yellowstone is going to blow up. And this is the plot of the movie. So this is how this was seen in the movie. This is the reality. <laughs> Just uh, tell me who works in this way. Having some submission scripts that you just write down and you don't, do not understand a couple of weeks later, uh, submitting the job to, uh, to the PPS, going for lunch or going for a vacation and to grab the, <coughs> the results and then examining the results in the text files. Don't, don't be shy, this is my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you, 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 share, you share the experience. So that's why we are introducing uh, the <coughs> graphical interfaces just to make some step towards uh, uh, the stuff that we have seen in the movie. Uh, on one side, we work still with the batch jobs on the infrastructure. The reason is quite pragmatic and quite economic. We are aiming at the best utilization of the infrastructure because the infrastructure and the electricity are expensive, so <coughs> we want to use it as much as possible. On the other hand, the users nowadays are not so happy with the <coughs> plain batch job approach as it has been here for 50 years. <coughs> so the graphical interfaces are some kind of <coughs> trade-off. And uh, they also help us to be more and more fair. Unfortunately, I missed the enlightening panel discussion yesterday, but uh, you should be aware of uh, the bright virtue that comes with the open science. And seriously, uh, the graphical interfaces provide some support and they provide it as an intrinsic part of the process so that you do your work, you get the support for making your results fair, and it is not something that would bother you and that you have to do on top of your work. So this is, this is fine. So the first option. In Meta Centrum, we provide the <coughs> open on-demand uh, service, and this is sort of typical scenario of uh, <coughs> user experience there. I, as a user, need some big computer, large memory, many cores, high-end CPUs for my calculation. I myself cannot afford it, and it makes no sense to buy such a machine and put it under my desk, because uh, I would need it for just a few hours per month. So I can go to the, to the on-demand and uh, just say what I need and for how long I need it, and I get it. I'm somewhat exaggerating here that uh, with the 60... Oh, what's going on? Uh, with the 64 uh, cores and uh, one terabyte of memory, I would wait some time, but essentially it works in this way. So uh, this is the architecture of the on-demand. This is uh, zero install stuff that the, uh, the user just uses uh, uh, the web browser of his or her computer, goes to the front end of, uh, of the on-demand where uh, there is the authentication, to provide your, your credential, this switches the identity and goes to the backend underneath, and this goes to the backend underneath as the user, as it is in, <coughs> in the infrastructure. In our case, it's spawning a batch job and running uh, another web server just under the identity of the user, and you get access to, to any tools that are there installed. Uh, one nice thing that is provided here is the accelerated 3D uh, remote desktop. This goes through my favorite technology, which is actually quite old, but it's been there and working efficiently. This is a virtual GL that uh, intercepts the open, C open GL calls that, uh, uh, that are responsible for, uh, for the 3D graphics. They use uh, the headless GPU that is uh, installed on the machine where the stuff runs, and the image is copied back. This is copied to the uh, VNC server that sends it, uh, encode it as video stream to the, to the client, and and uh, finally, the client is the no VNC, <coughs> which, uh, which is again a piece of software that uses the more or less uh, 
modern uh, web browser technology to display the video and you get the experience of interactively working with the GPU. This can be quite powerful GPU. The, power, the, the GPU can be shared among the users seamlessly and you are getting the, <coughs> the graphical interface of the application with all the 3D stuff. Uh, one more technical point, uh, what is underneath, there is uh, optimized scheduling of the jobs that go through the open demand. That there is uh, dedicated PBSQ where the job ends up and this is the handled by dedicated uh, scheduler. Uh, the advantage of this is the fast turnaround. If you submit normal <coughs> batch jobs to Metacentrum, you are sharing the same queue and the same scheduler with uh, probably thousands of other jobs. So it takes some time for the scheduler to plan, uh, plan the job. Here, this is uh, this is dedicated are just few jobs that go through uh, through on demand and they go preferably to uh, to dedicated computer nodes if the computer nodes are not available the job, job is just moved to normal queue uh, and this works in sort of statistical way that about 50 percent of the jobs are scheduled immediately and immediately means here in less than one minute the one minute is my experience the 50 percent is the figure that is reported by colleague and i trust them Uh, in, in open demand, there are several prepared applications like and this uh, genomics workbench, VMD, which is the one, 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 one of the uh, 3D accelerated one, and also MATLAB, R Studio, and Jupyter notebooks. And besides that, uh, you can get a generic desktop environment with the 3D acceleration, and you can issue a module at whatever you need command, and you are getting the access to the whole Metacentrum computing environment with all the software there, but uh, with the access to the remote, the remote desktop. And last but not least, there is also a plain shell application, which is nice if you want to check something with just your mobile phone, that you don't have to install the shell on the mobile phone and deal with Kerberos tickets and things like that. Another option is Rancher. Lukash mentioned it in his talk, and uh, from the user, <coughs> user perspective, it's something quite similar. The technology underneath is different, and uh, uh, the difference is at the user level are quite subtle. Maybe the Rancher is uh, a bit <coughs> less intuitive sometimes because it's much more flexible. It, uh, it can handle virtually anything with, with Kubernetes, which is not the case for on-demand. And there is also a uh, different set of prepared applications, but for, for the user, for essential user experience, it's still quite, it's quite similar. And finally, uh, Galaxy. Uh, how many Galaxy users are here in the audience? Not, 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 not so many, actually. So Galaxy is uh, a long-running pro project. It could be even for, for decades, I guess. And it's, uh, it's supported by a very large community uh, worldwide. And what, what is here, this is sort of salesman language, but it essentially tells the truth that uh, this is open source platform for uh, making many, many pieces of software available to the user in a <coughs> sort of graphical way that, uh, that is convenient. And if you, if you come with whatever software you choose, you are quite likely that someone before at least tried to wrap this software to be used to, to Galaxy so that it is published in some of the Galaxy repositories and you can grab it. And it supports uh, building workflows out of those tools and uh, working with quite large infrastructure. There are several publicly available uh, installations of the Galaxy. That one comes from US, this is the European one, and this is, uh, this is that one that, uh, that we operate on our resources. All of them give more or less the same set of tool. Uh, we run this one because of uh, enabling the resources to the users of the Czech national uh, e infrastructure in larger extents than the, the, the shared one on European or worldwide level. Uh, this is just <coughs> just some example of, of, of some tool. It's sort of old-fashioned interface where you 
provide the input file for, for the computation, set some parameters with either number of the slide bar, add some optional parameters and just, just push the execute button and that's it. And you end up in uh, the, uh, the environment of Galaxy, where on the left side there is the tool panel <coughs> With, uh, with the menu of the tools, and there, there are really hundreds of them. On the right side, there is uh, something that Galaxy calls history. And history is a folder, but it's not a plain folder where just the files are stored, but <coughs> Galaxy keeps quite thorough track of the origin of the files. So that if you, if you click on, on one of them, the two, 165, you, you get the information that this one was generated from inputs 163 and 164 by running this tool with these extra parameters and with some, some timestamp and so on. So, so this, is, uh, this is the support for, uh, for the fairness of the data that you keep uh, with, with every calculation that you spawn with just filling the form uh, of the tool execution in Galaxy, you are getting uh, the whole history on computation. And you can, uh, you can work quite uh, long here, 165 is not so many files actually in the history in one of my experience, then you can eventually prune it uh, by deleting uh, unsuccessful attempts and so on. And you carry on, you tell Galaxy, export me the workflow of this, of this history. And this is just the graph of, uh, of this, uh, the sequence of tool invocations with recorded parameters, recorded file names. And this is something that you can export in a file and share it with your colleague working in France, Germany, US, and uh, he or she can try it uh, on, on his, his own data, and uh, that's fine. And you are quite sure that he's doing the same calculation as you did, because the versions of the tools are recorded there, the, <coughs> the additional parameters are the recorded there as, there as well. So one more point for, uh, for the fairness, reproducibility, and, and so on. You can install your Galaxy on your own. It's just, just grab the source code, run one uh, script that is called run.sh, start scrunching for 10 minutes and you end up with your dedicated Galaxy on your computer where everything is local and you can use one of the, the public instances that I advertised before. They, there is some agreement in the community to build this as so-called Pulsar Network. Pulsar is another component of the Galaxy community that, that abstracts from, uh, from the computing side, from the batch system, and the Galaxy is told to pull Pulsar to send the jobs there and receive <coughs> the results back. So that's, it's scalable in this, uh, this way. Uh, for the Czech users, we provide use galaxy.cz uh, instance, which follows the Pulsar architecture and there are uh, generally more resources and more generous quotas for users both in, in terms of computing resources and storage resources for those who come through, through the authentication of the Czech uh, e-infra. <coughs> and finally, Jupyter Notebooks. This was also mentioned in, in Lukas' talk and I, I start uh, again with an example and again with a question. How many of you ever worked with Jupyter? Uh, quite many actually, so I, <coughs> I needn't explain in, in too much detail, it's just mixing the text and uh, at code execution and I'm bringing this example by Honza Baranak from University of Chemistry and Technology because he, he managed to do it uh, very neatly. I really like this, uh, this usage because it, there is some, some, some description with some examples, explanation of the examples, then there is the, the, the real code. Uh, some results of it and uh, some visualization as well. And for, for from the technical point of view, uh, we say that uh, one size does not fit all in this case and we provide essentially three possible installations of Jupyter Notebook. One goes through, through on demand. I'm, I've, I've been speaking about it. You just go, go there, click on Jupyter Notebook, specify the, uh, the extent of the resources and time and you get it. Or you can do essentially the same through, uh, through the hub, uh, for the Jupyter hub that we provide that, that sits on top of, <coughs> of the Kubernetes. In, 
normal user approach, there is little difference between these, these two. They just use the different technology, but this is transparent to the user. When you start building something more sophisticated, you perceive the difference and you choose uh, whatever suits you better. Uh, here you can, uh, can follow the, the rest of the Metacentrum environments, get access to all the software, submit eventual jobs to, to the batch system and so on. Here you can, uh, you can leverage on the features of Kubernetes, like orchestrating multiple containers working together, sharing some volumes and not sharing some others, passing messages, allocating another resources, and so on and so on. So this depends just on the complex scenario. For the simple one, there is little difference. And finally, there is the instance of uh, uh, EGI notebooks uh, that go through the international community, and the international community is a bit more conservative in uh, adapting the stuff. So, so there must be much wider agreement. So this is good for, uh, for international collaborations with, within the, the EGI community. There are also some uh, different options for, uh, for providing the data, but this is, this is getting actually uh, synchronized. And maybe one day we end up with, with merging all the stuff together. Technically, the notebooks, EGI notebooks, are also built on top of Kubernetes. And that's it. That uh, we provide some of the interactive environments. We are still lagging about 20 years behind the, uh, the, the feelings of the movie makers and movie directors, but we are doing our, our best. <coughs> we provide the graphical uh, environments that are quite generic, like on demand, and then uh, <coughs> Ranger, uh, we, we pay special attention to the Jupyter notebooks, which is nicely reflected here in the auditory that many of you raised your hand when I mentioned the Jupyter, so this is something that is really used. And we, uh, we are members of the international Galaxy community and we operate the Galaxy services here. Uh, Essentially, through these tools, you can get full access to, uh, to the infrastructure that we provide. We believe that we provide better user experience than just the plain batch job interface, and we support also some open science. It's not an excuse. You still have to spend some effort on, on making your data fair, but here you've got the tools. Uh, are there any questions? Good talk, Good talk. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, some questions online, so we can take those. We have three questions here. How do you run Jupyter in open on demand? Is it inside of a VN, for Conda, Uptainer, or different? Uh, actually, it is in a singularity image. It's, it's PBS job, the trans singularity image. You can even choose from, uh, uh, from predefined images or provide an, an image on, on your own. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we need our license for CLC genomics? Uh, maybe this is not a question to me, actually. Uh, Ivana, can you answer this or? Uh, or is, is, is someone who manages the licenses here. Uh, there, there, actually, there is no, uh, no difference to the, to the standard. Stand if, we need a, if you need to bring in a license for CSC genomic or... or uh, But this is, this, is, this is the same, uh, this, is, this is exactly the same. You just grab one of that license if you use it. Yes. So the answer is yes. It's supported by our license. So once it is yes, it is supported by the license the is available. Final question. And the final question, for those on-demand jobs which uh, go into the queue, uh, how can we be aware when it's running before wall time finished? Uh, well, you... Uh you get uh, the status information on, on the page of on demand. I'm, I'm not sure whether there can be some, uh, some, some notification through email registered or something. You, you just have to, have to pull on, on that page or keep that page open and it, uh, it goes green when the job starts. Mm -hmm. 
have the mail, but not while it's starting. When the job is starts, we don't get any notification, but it ends, that time we will get the notification through mail. Uh, yes, probably through, through because again, this is uh, uh, this is job that is submitted to the queue system in exactly the same way as you would do it manually. So it's, it's just just the only one does it on your behalf and sets up the environment of the singularity and so on. But, but just default parameters. So if you want to change it, you can. I'll just predefine what, what you think it makes sense. Okay. Any more questions? If there is uh, no other question, I can I will ask a question. So, if I understand this correctly, open on demand is basically a very neat technology that allows us to obtain a graphical user interface for any kind of application that is running behind on the supercomputer, and it, this can be even integrated with uh, with a scheduler to to schedule execution. Yeah, this is, this is done uh, done that way. This is integrated yes. with scheduler. You, you yes. start start with as a bad job and uh, so all the environment is set yes, up So for. the question is. Uh, yeah, it, it looks like this is really suitable and this can be extended for any kind of, of any favorite uh, graphical user interface application that you may have. Are there any limits? Is there, are there classes of applications for which open on demand is not suitable or can we just uh, rely that whatever we wish, we wish can be delivered in open on demand? Well, actually, I don't think there are too, uh, too, too many limits uh, per se. What is limiting here is the, perf the, the network connection. That uh, uh, if, if, if you generate complex images, you need some bandwidth. But there is there is some uh, nice compression. And, uh, and, and if, you, if you need interactivity, you need low latency. Yes, so only the, only the network connection and the latency. Yeah. Yes, actually, on-demand is uh, quite general and quite conservative. I uh, I recall that the stuff that uh, that Lukas runs in uh, in Rancher uses some different technology, which is uh, probably uh, delivering a bit better latency, obviously for some price. That it's not uh, not so generally applicable. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much for your answers and. Uh And uh, in the next uh, session, we'll be discussing best practices, practical examples uh, of how to tame batch computations and data, both on Metacentrum and uh, at IT for Innovation. So I would like to invite uh, my colleague Andrei Metza and uh, our colleague uh, Jerzy Vorel, who will share this, uh, this uh, half an hour. So please go ahead. So is it, yeah, is it working? So thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jiří Vorel, and I am a member of Metacentrum User Support Group. And I would like to tell you something about how to use Metacentrum and how to use our infrastructure in the most like, comfortable way for you. And it, this presentation will be very brief because I'm afraid we, we can spend the entire day on this discussion how to use Metacentrum and even so that not all questions would be answered. So it will be just like a very brief overview. And I will be here after this off session. So if you have questions, you can ask me later on. So it's not a problem to show you something if you will be interested. So Mire Kruda had a very nice presentation yesterday about Metacentrum. So like, what is it and what's the purpose of this infrastructure for you as for users? So I would like to skip this theoretical part and point it out. Is it working? Yeah, that on, on almost every of my uh, slides, you can find uh, at least one uh, uh, link to the documentation where you can find more relevant information to the topic which is discussed on that concrete, uh, on, on that specific uh, slide. So I would last start with this last point that Metacentrum, what can Metacentrum offers for you? So Metacentrum can give you uh, compute uh, resources, for, for resources for calculations. So, traditional CPUs and now very common and very frequently asked GPUs for GPU associated calculations. So as Mirek said, we have more of more than 5,000 uh, 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 application tools. To be more specific, it, it's, it's about 5,100 5, uh, different tools. 
We have, we have uh, some data storage capacities for your, their, for your data. Of course, we can, we can, we can offer you to, to some like a graphic envir environment. So if you work to, uh, some like gra graphic user inter interface, if you, work, if you need to work with a graphic environment, like uh, very popular applications like MATLAB, ANSYS, or RStudio, and also what is quite, quite popular, so we can offer you something for a container solution. And to be more specific, we are using a Singularity, or now it's named Obtainer, which is like something like an alternative to Docker for HPC. So this is like a, the graphical presentation of, 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 of what I said like before, that we can start from the front bottom, so we have like, like a, some, some portion of, of pure hardware resources for you, and on the level of infrastructure, you can use, you can use them for as, uh, via PBS scheduler for uh, like a typical batch of interacti interactive job for in Metacentrum. As Lukáš said before me, you can use these resources for uh, Kubernetes, and if you want to be absolutely independent on us and you want to work on your own, so you can use, you can use these resources for, uh, for a cloud, so start your own, uh, your own cloud, no, cloud machine, which is uh, operated by uh, OpenStack. On a platform level, this was mentioned everything by Alesh, so we can provide for you like a Galaxy, you can start a Jupyter Norbooks, or if you want to work with, uh, in a graphical environment, so you can start with an on-demand application, and on the on the level of uh, of, a, of, a, of a specific applications, so this is just an example interactive uh, like graphical applications. All of them all of them are well well known and uh, like a highly used like MATLAB, Gromax, R, Studio, ANSYS, and so on. So this is just a few examples. We have much more tools for you which you can use, basically absolutely free of charge, of course. Uh, as I said, and this is like a reminder for you that uh, that uh, that uh, online slides you can find. Plenty of, uh, plenty of links to the documentation. So I would like to remind you again and once more that uh, our original like wiki, do, uh, our original documentation hosted on wiki was so one year before like uh, it's not it's not uh, developed develop anymore, and we switched to the new uh, to the new documentation which is available under this this link. So if you are looking for some information, I would recommend to you uh, be looking here and not here, and. And it, if you think that some information is missing in, our, our, in our, our new documentation, so don't be afraid, so email us and let us know that, hey, I think that something what was, what was in Wiki was useful for me and it's now, it's not in the, in the new documentation. Can you edit and we can, we can figure out some how to do it. So as a, as a new users, you have to deal with something which is, which is called front-end. So this is front-end, it's like a main interface for you. It's a relatively small, like a, a machine where you, which is suitable for direct login, and on this on this node on this virtual servers, you can you can check your data, you can check your, you can check if you have uh, uh, available tools which you need. You can write your script for your batch job. You can start your interactive calculation. Basically, you can do some like a very small and not so demanding like operation, and like uh, this is like uh, the most the most like uh, important. F uh, like a part of the infrastructure for you because we are front ends, you can operate everything. Uh, I will, I will, I will stay with with, uh, with from uh, with this with this picture in Metacentrum. We have knife like a different front end front ends for you. Uh, this front ends operates on a dif on the different on the different storages. You can use like a traditional CD command and move between between individual storages, so it's not a problem to be locked on the front end. For example, scare it and move to the to the to the absolutely different storage. And from and these metacentrum storages, uh, sorry, these metacentrum frontends are submit uh, sub, submit the jobs uh, to the to the original scheduler called MetaPBS. And now we have uh, this, and this. This is a big new, and I will be talking about this a little bit later. We have uh, we have a new scheduler called PBS M1. Of course, we have we have like a, I did something wrong. Thanks. Uh, of course, we have uh, also like a uh, Elmo frontend, which is dedicated for for people from uh, Elixir, uh, Elixir group, and we are this we are this we are this frontend. You can submit your jobs to the to the Elixir PBS server, server and still write information that we have a Zufix front frontend, which is which is uh, used for a submit to, to your jobs to the Cerid PBS. Uh, as I said, frontends these frontends are not so. Not so like a dedicated for a, for a long and demand so demanding like calculations. So do not do not run wrong, long and demanding calculations on these front ends. Basically, you can you can significantly slow down these front ends for other users, and the work for it will be 
uncomfortable for, for all of them and all of us. Uh, as I said, recently we introduced a new, new scheduler for, called Open PBS. This is, this, is, this is the full name of, of, of the PBS server. And this server in the near future totally uh, replaced the current and let's say old, old scheduler PBS, PBS Pro. Again, there is, this, is, this, is the, this is the server name of that, of that, old, old, of that old, old scheduler. Uh, what is important for you as a for user that nothing has changed for you. Uh, the syntax of QSEP commands is still the same, but what, what, ch what has changed, if you are using, like, a, for example, here, a specific, specific queues to, for a, a job submission, for example, if you want to submit some GPU calculations, we have to submit your calculation to the GPU queue, or if you, are, if you, are, if you need a high amount of, of memory for your, for your memory intense like a job, so you have, to, you have to submit your jobs to the large mem queue. So, in your script, you have to change just, uh, just the name of the PBS server. So this is the old version on the left side, and this is the new, this is the new left, uh, this is new version on the, on the right side. Everything is mentioned much more deeper in, into this, into this uh, in, in our documentation on, the, on that link. Uh, of course, with the, uh, we use this, we use this, uh, this situation with, with, uh, with, with the switching between PBS server that uh, our compute nodes, which are currently available under this new PBS server, were also upgraded to the new, to the new Debian version. From the, so we upgraded from Debian 11 to Debian, to Debian 12, and we also have a couple of couple of Debian, a couple of frontends which which are running on a Debian 12. So this is this is this is oh, you can find it. You can the list of the frontends is mentioned here, and what is very like uh, what is uh, very important to say that the Debian that the frontends with Debian 12 12 by default submit the jobs to the, to the new scheduler open PBS but you, if you are using for example very popular frontend Skirit, which is still running on a Debian 11 so this frontend submits jobs to the old 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 scheduler PBS pro uh, be aware that, uh, that uh, the amount of resources available in the old old scheduler uh, is very low and you are not able to submit the currently you are not able to submit a job which takes more than four days so I would recommend Recommend, recommend, and recommend, and recommend. Start using this new Open PBS scheduler. It's, it will be much more better, and there is much more resources currently. Uh, and yeah, one point: uh, if you if you are using so some older, no, not 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 upgraded uh, front end with the Benedict asked, you can use Open PBS module, and after this, you will be able to submit to your jobs to the new to the new scheduler. Uh, so as I said, we keep our our uh, OS on our uh, operation system of our nodes up to date, so we are we are upgrading, and it means that uh, even the composition of libraries in the in the in the different versions of Debian is, has changed. So it so it can it can involve invoke some like an error or something like this one, and it means that uh, there's some some software tool which was com which which was compiled on a Debian 11 is now in, will not be working on the Debian 12 because some library is missing. So if you will, so if you will find out that, yeah, sorry, if you will find out some error, something like this, so we offer for this, for this kind of, kind of errors, uh, modules called Debian and some number, and in these modules you can find uh, uh, libraries which were missing in, in, uh, which, uh, in the previous, in the new, new version of Debian. For example, there is a Debian 11 module, and this module includes uh, libraries which are missing uh, in, the, in the Debian 12. So in, more case, in, more, in most cases, it works if you will, if you will upload, upload, uh, activate any of these Deb Debian compact, compact module, and basically it will bring this data missing library to the, to the environment, and the application will start work again. So if not, you can email us. Don't be afraid to email us that, hey, it's not working and I don't know what to do. And we are here to help you, so we will figure out how to, how to do it. Uh, another quite common problem which our users have is that is uh, how, to, how to manipulate data, how to copy, how to copy data, how to transfer data. And now this, this is an example just uh, uh, tries to explain how to move data from your local computer to our storages. So, what is, uh, there is a subject, subject of recommendation, so if you have a very high number of very small files, so try, try to like, uh, compress them so into, into, some, into, into some archive, so it's not, it's not so effective if you are, if you are trying to move like a 10 million of, of, of very small files, it's very slow, 
and at the end, it's not comfortable for you. So, and another, another point, what is like a very, quite, uh, very common mistake, the tutors are copying very large, very large, large amount of data directly to the, to the, to the, to the, to the front, no, not directly, but they are, they are copying uh, data to the, to, the, to the storages via some front end. So this is, this is, this is example here, here, and try to imagine that you are, that you live in Pilsen, and now we are copying some, some data to the, to the script, to the script front end, which is the, which is located in Brno, and from that script you are, you are moving to, the, to your data to the Praha. So, so your data will, will do like a very nice journey from Pilsen to Brno and from Pilsen uh, from Brno back to, back to Prague. So it's, it's it's not effective. So instead of this, use use like a direct uh, direct access to the to the to the, to the storage server, and you will be able to copy copy your data much faster and directly to the to the storage. storage. This, is, this, is, this is example how to copy copy data from your computer to our storage, and this is the example how to copy again your data, but from our storage to your to your local local computer. Again, it's, it's explained on this here here or, or this or these links, and there is much much more examples. Uh, when I when I was speaking about like storage servers, here you can find here you can find out the, the, the complete list, list of, of all storages which we have. Metacentrum can offer can have for you a uh, mm, well, lot of like independent, independent storages. All of them are accessible via all, all front 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 ends and from uh, via for for all compute nodes. And be aware that all that on on each front uh, on each uh, server, there is a quota for a total total volume, data volume, and for a number of uh, of individual files size. So it's so again, if you are working with a high amount of very small files, so you can should you should compress them because you will be running out of quota. And what is what is also very important to say that metacentrum storages are are dedicated to the data uh, in active use. So we are not we are not like a, you can use no you should not use us like a, like a archive. So if you have some some like a data which are very valuable for you, so you should contact our, our my colleagues from uh, data, uh, data services, and they will tell you how to. As we said, like David Antosh was talking about this today, how to how to like deal with this. Uh, this is another example how to how to work with data. So, but this example is not like how to copy data from your local computer meta centrum and in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the another direction. This is an example how to how to move data uh, in your batch, respective into interactive jobs. So, as we said again, again, and again, if you are start your jobs and doesn't matter if it's batch jobs or interactive job. Uh, every time ask for uh, for a scratch. Scratch is a uh, temporary storage storage space on on that on a dedicated compute node, where you can put inside to that scratch all your input data, all your scripts, all your files, and it is and at the end this in this scratch will be will be located your results, some temporary files, everything. If you have if you have very like a very small portions of data, like a couple of gigabytes, so you can use like a, this old-fashioned like a CP command and copy some 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 your data for for example in this example from Brno developed series storage to the scratch. But if you are working with a higher data volumes, so it's so it's again is the same story. So it's much more better and much more faster for you at the end. Use some like a better approach, for example, a CP command and copy your data directly. Uh, from the from the st from the storage server, and this is the, this is the, like a, uh, another another uh, like another direction how to copy data from from a scratch to your to your to your store server. You can do it like in this on this old way if you have a lot so small number of data or something like a, a more sophisticated if, if you have if you have more data. Uh, another quite. Uh, frequently asked question is if, if users can install up the uh, application on their, on their own. Yes, you can, and we very uh, it is it, we, we prefer this way. So you can do it in your home or in your, in your scratch. You are not able to you are not able to write to the root directory like user bin and so and so on. And we have a plenty of ways how to do how to do it. So for example, you can install your like a Python. You can install your your uh, thank you. You can install your Python packages we are, uh, with, with pip command, but with a user option and with a, with a Python user base variable. 
you can also install R packages again with with a, with a lip with a lip parameter and set some path to your home. You can use for this uh, any of our like uh, modules for R. You can also like uh, freely like uh, download and use like a uh, like uh, pre-prepared uh, binary files. You can install pair libraries with cpanem. It's not a problem, but this is this is the probably in my opinion like uh, up to to this date like uh, the most popular way you can use like uh, the, you can use these snake like package managers from uh, mostly we can offer all of them most common are mamba and comba uh, mamba and conda but we prefer use manda because mamba is a conda on steroids manda is much faster better uh, can solve much more complicated environments uh, we have we have we offer manda via mamba forge modules this is the link to the origin uh, official manda conda repository when you can find if the, if your if your tool can be installed via Mamba, so there, but there is uh, hundreds and hundreds of tools which you can install with Mamba, so there is no, there is no most, mostly there is no problem. And here our documentation, here again there is a link, there is a step-by-step -step example how to install install some, some packages. In more, case, in more cases, if you use this example like uh, copy-paste copy -paste mode, you will be able to install everything. If not, let us know, we will help you. There is an example how to install it, how to use it, how to use that install environment in your job, and we have much more, we have some examples how to install something in a, in a let's say in one command. So more, more examples in our documentation, just, 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 uh, just a brief overview. Uh, of course, you can you can use some traditional like a compiler, so like a GCC, AO, AOCC for AMD, 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 AMD processor. If if you want to use CUDA, no problem. We have CUDA modules, Open MPI for parallelization, uh, and we have a plant like a plenty of various uh, uh, Intel compilers. So users sometimes are confused which which Intel compilers can should be used. So I would say that. Uh, Try to try to the newest one, which is the Intel One API. This is the new latest generation of Intel compilers. But it depends also how your code is is old. If you, if you have very old code, so it will not be working uh, with uh, with the new modules. I have last three slides. Wait a bit, just one minute. Uh, this is what I was talking about. So we can offer uh, like uh, how to work with, with containers. So we are not using Docker because Docker is so suitable for HPC centers. So we are using so let's let's call it singularity. Sing, but singularity can can work with all generally with all Docker Docker images. So and I would I wanted to say mainly for you that we can offer just a plenty of like a pre boot and ready to use singularity images. For example, images available accessible from a NVIDIA GP, GPU cloud like a Kali PowerTorch and for example, TensorFlow. But these, 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 these NVIDIA singularity images, oh, these NVIDIA images are highly optimized for a, for a GPU usage. So if you want to use like a PowerTorch, so PyTorch from, from, the, from, the, from, this, from here will be much more faster if you will install local, local, locally. Yeah. Uh, with, with PIP, for example. So I'm running out of time. So thank you for your attention. I will let this slide, this slide on, on, those, on the screen. So if you don't have any questions, so really this is, there, is, there is some useful tool which you can use and which can, which can help you. But if you have questions, so we are free to ask. Thank you very much for <coughs> a, lot of, uh, a lot of interesting details <laughs> and insights. We have a lot of questions, I'm not sure if location of the probably the, the, the cluster, which cluster uh, or which resource the, the user should be targeting. So it's like a general like a uh, like uh, how to grid use, so you should not try to pick up like a specific cluster. So if you will try to specific cluster, for example, I want to run my job at uh, Adana node, so basically it's contraproductive and your job will be, will be queuing because there is a plenty of other nodes which, 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 could be, which should be also suitable for this job and your job can be run on, more, on, on a higher number of, of nodes and basically will start sooner. 
if you want, you can. We have some special nodes, so maybe you can, you can need like, like a, some specific like a parameters that you know that only this join is this node is suitable for me, and I need this one. So yes, you basically don't have a choice. But most of user don't need this. Okay. Yeah, you you can you can choose it. Yeah, but still, it's a better. Okay, give me this architecture, this architecture of CPUs, and you have like, a, for example, ten clusters with that architecture because it's the same processor. Processor, but it's still better if you say, okay, I build this one specific node. Yeah, it's just you know, just ten percent of that of the scale. Okay, there is a number of other questions, but I'm afraid we have run out of time to to go through this. Uh, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> And I would like to invite uh, Ondra, Met Ondra Metza from IT for Innovations to, to give his talk about how to efficiently run the workloads at IT for I. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Ondra Metza and uh, I am from uh, IT for Innovation and I will say something about SLARM and how to map your application and how to pin and why to do it. Uh, SLARM is job scheduler used uh, by, all I, uh, by all system uh, at IT4I, so if you want to run your application on Carolina or Barbara or Lumi, you should use uh, SLARM. There is a lot of documentation for SLARM. Uh, there is documentation uh, at uh, IT4I, at uh, Lumi and so on, so this documentation contains many nice examples how to how to use uh, SLARM for running your application. Basically, the simplest way is to create some, uh, some batch script uh, that uh, can be seen at the right, uh, right side of my slide. Uh, at, the at the beginning of the, of the script, there are parameters for SLARM, SLARM like uh, job name, uh, project ID, partition where you want to run your application, how many nodes you want to use, uh, how many tasks per, per nodes, and so on. Uh, there is also uh, wall time that should be specified specify according to your application needs. Please specify this uh, wall time as precise as possible because uh, SLARM can optimize uh, scheduling according to this, uh, to this wall time. Because uh, when you run your job, uh, SLARM copy environment uh, uh, variables and modules to, to, the, uh, uh, to the job. Uh, the best practice is uh, at the beginning of your job uh, to purge all uh, modules and then uh, load uh, modules that are needed for your application in order to get uh, always the same environment. And then you can use uh, this uh, S uh, SRUN command to start your application. This SRUN command is substitution for, uh, for example, MPI run uh, with a similar uh, behavior, but uh, it is recommended by, uh, to, it is recommended to use uh, SRUN instead of MPI run. When your job uh, script is ready, you should, uh, you can use uh, sbatch uh, utility for uh, submit, uh, for submitting your script uh, to the queue. And for example, if you uh, want to uh, use some, if you want to change some parameters, all para parameters that are in, uh, in the job script can be substituted by uh, command line arguments. For example, if you want to run this script on uh, two nodes only, you can use uh, the same parameter in command line argument uh, before when, or when you're submitting uh, the script to the queue. Uh, it is uh, very easy how to use it. Uh, there are another utilities that are provided by, by SLARM. For example, if you want to start uh, interactive jobs, you can uh, use uh, SALOG utility with the similar parameters that, can, uh, that were used uh, in the script. Then you can start uh, your job by S uh, run command. For example, there is an uh, example how to run your application with uh, 128 uh, MPI processes. When your job is run running, uh, then there is a uh, SQ uh, command that uh, can show you information about your running uh, jobs. You can uh, 
you can see if uh, the job is running or is uh, 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 still waiting uh, in, the, in the queue or when uh, the job will be started and so on. If you want to uh, uh, cancel the jo job, uh, there is a uh, cancel utility and uh, information about nodes and partitions can be listed by as uh, info. Uh, SLARM is basically about uh, uh, asking for some hardware resources, uh, but if you uh, get your hardware, you should be aware how to efficiently run your application on uh, provided hardware. There are two, two, uh, three types of application in my uh, presentation. The first application is threaded application. Uh, this application can be run on a single node. Uh, up to, you can use up to 128 uh, threads. It can be set by OMP num threads uh, variable, and then you can run your application with uh, SRUN again. If you have a pure MPI application, you can run your application uh, on more uh, nodes. Uh, in my example, I run my application uh, on uh, four nodes with uh, 500 uh, MPI processes. And uh, in the case of hybrid ap application, this application can utilize both uh, MPI and OpenMP. And uh, in this, uh, with this application, you can combine threading and uh, MPI uh, to maybe better utilize uh, the hardware. Okay, if I uh, look to hardware de description of Carolina, I can see that uh, there are CPUs with uh, 64 cores. Because each node has two sockets, I can use up to 128 uh, uh, threads or MPI processes per node. So I can, if I have pure MPI application, I can run my application uh, in the following way. Or if I have hybrid application, I can use uh, my application with threads and uh, MPI. But uh, what is interesting question, is this setting uh, best possible? Uh, if I run uh, my application in the following way, uh, it, is, it is the best way how, how to do it, or there is uh, maybe some better setting. In order to answer this question, I uh, prepare some simple application. I uh, compile this application not at Carolina, because Carolina is currently unavailable because uh, Carolina is updating now. So I compiled my application at complementary system with a very, very similar hardware uh, with, uh, with CPU provided by M uh, AMD. Uh, this CPU has uh, the same number of n NUMA domains and so on. Uh, like it, it is very similar hard hardware to Carolina. And I compile my application with OpenMP and uh, try to run my application with a different number of uh, MPI processes. I start with four MPI processes and uh, the, the biggest number was uh, 64. And I uh, measured the overall time of my application. And uh, as you can see, uh, the best uh, overall time was achieved uh, if I use 64 MPI processes, it is the number of cores of, uh, of this, uh, this uh, hardware. Uh, so it looks like that 64 MPI processes is the best possible setting. It looks like that if I use all cores, it is, uh, the, it is the best option. But is it true? Am I missing something? It is not scaling properly, and uh, why not? I will describe it later, because what I am missing, I am missing mapping and pinning. If I run this application in the following way, uh, my application is mapped to the hardware resources uh, randomly. So how to improve the performance of my application? Uh, in order to uh, do it properly, uh, I should look more, uh, to, uh, more closely to, to the hardware. And uh, uh, I should uh, correctly set mapping and pinning. What is mapping? Mapping is, uh, mapping specify how two software components are mapped to the 
uh, hardware, uh, hardware resources. For example, if I look closer to, uh, to this uh, CPU that I used, uh, there are four NUMA domains. And uh, what is important, each NUMA domain has uh, two, two, two channels to the memory and 16 uh, uh, cores. And uh, what is uh, important, if uh, I uh, have, for example, MPI process that reside on the first NUMA domain, and if this process wants to read something from uh, the second NUMA domain, it is slower than reading uh, data from its own memory. Because each node has uh, uh, two sockets, uh, it means that reading something from NUMA domain from the second socket, it's, it's even slower than, than reading uh, data from my, my memory. So, uh, in order to utilize this hardware uh, most efficiently, I should map my uh, MPI processes or threads across all available uh, NUMA domains, and I should pin uh, the processes to, to this NUMA domain. Pin, uh, pinning, it means that, uh, because if I uh, start my ap MPI application, this, uh, some MPI process can start computation on uh, one NUMA domain and uh, operation system can migrate this uh, MPI process to another NUMA domain that uh, is, it, it is not optimal behavior. If I pin my process to particular core, uh, operation system cannot move this process to another NUMA domain. So, uh, how to set uh, my uh, how how to set mapping or pinning of my application? Uh, it is dependent on the used uh, software. If I use OpenMPI, there is a parameter of MPI run, map by, uh, for example, socket, NUMA, L3, L3 cache, and and so on. Uh, in the case of Intel MPI, there is a, uh, environment variable. Uh, I MPI pin domain with uh, similar parameters. In the case of OpenMP, they, there is uh, OpenM o OMP prods bind with uh, close or, or spread variables. Uh, if I use close, it means that uh, threads will be uh, <coughs> mapped to, to close cores as possible. Uh, if I use spread, the threads will be uh, spread across or available. available course, I will describe it uh, in more details later. Because in our system we use uh, SLARM, uh, SLARM uh, use uh, the following parameters, CPU bind with uh, similar parameters uh, for OpenMP and uh, Intel MPI, and uh, the most easiest way how to, how to specify mapping and pinning is uh, with the uh, C parameter that specify number of uh, CPUs per task. Uh, it basically it is how many cores uh, will be uh, assigned to each uh, MPI process. Uh, okay, if I uh, run my application again with slight different setting, I uh, what, what is different? Different is that I add uh, uh, to as run comment this uh, C parameter, and uh, I run my application again. And I can check uh, the results. Now uh, I can see that the most optimal way is to run my application with, uh, with 16 MPI processes. Uh, and this, uh, the, the time achieved by 16 MPI processes is uh, about 8% faster than previous, the best option with uh, 64 MPI processes. Uh, why 16 MPI processes? If I, oh, no, uh, if I return to, to this slide, uh, I said that each NUMA domain has uh, uh, two memory channels. Uh, because there are four NUMA domains and two sockets, it means that uh, there are uh, 16 memory channels at all. And it is the reason why 16 MPI processes is uh, the best uh, option because I, uh, I utilize this memory channel efficiently. Uh, evidently, this uh, application, this my application is a memory bound application. And because the, the throughput to the memory is more the most valuable resource, resource I should uh, work with this uh, resource in, in, in the following way. 
if I have only Reddit application, I can uh, use the following setting to get the similar behavior. I set number of threads to 16, and I set uh, OMP prods bind to spread. And uh, as you can see uh, on the HTOP utility, the threads are assigned uh, across all, uh, all NUMA domains almost uh, in the optimal way, and uh, the running time is almost the same uh, like for uh, my M MPI application that I <coughs> run before. Uh, at the end, uh, here are my recommendation, uh, or general recommendation. If you have memory-bound application, you should set uh, number of MPI processes or thread uh, equal to uh, the number of memory channels of your hardware, that is uh, 16 for, uh, for our clusters, and you should uh, correct, uh, uh, correctly pin uh, your uh, MPI processes to NUMA domains. If you have compute-bound application, uh, the best possible settings should be uh, to use as many MPI processes and thread as possible. So if you uh, want to run uh, your job on Carolina, use uh, 128 uh, MPI processes, but uh, try to uh, pin your, uh, your processes to particle cores. And if you have application and you are not aware if your application is memory or compute bound or is something uh, in the middle, try to run your application with uh, different uh, number of MPI processes. Start with 16 and then use more, uh, more MPI processes and try to, or try to different mapping and pinning of thread. For example, try to use close or spread uh, binding and so on. Uh, at the end, uh, there is a little bit more advanced binding because uh, with, uh, with uh, SRAN, you can uh, manually specify the mask for each uh, MPI process, and uh, this mask is hexa uh, numerical number, uh, where each uh, <coughs> number uh, uh, specifies four cores. Uh, it means that if I uh, specify mask uh, uh, 100, it means that uh, eight uh, cores are skipped and uh, my first MPI process will be assigned to, uh, to the number, uh, uh, to the core, uh, to the core nine. Uh, in the case of second MPI process, I skip 12 uh, cores and uh, uh, second MPI process will be assigned to uh, to the core uh, 13 and, and so on. This can be uh, useful, for example, in the case of, uh, of uh, application that utilize GPU because GPUs are connected to, uh, uh, to NUMA domain uh, one, three, five, and, uh, and seven. So if you uh, map your, uh, your MPI processes in the following way, uh, these MPI processes will be closer to, to the accelerator. So uh, it's all, so thank you for your attention, and if you have any question. Thank you very much. I would like to stress that this, uh, this pinning and so on is very important for performance. This can really make a great difference. So are there questions? That, there was a question here. So uh, why SLAM and not uh, PBS? So it was the question of money or flexibility or do you use it from the beginning of IT4i? Because the PBS was used in the metacentrum much. Maybe I can answer that. Uh, we used to live with PBS for a very long time until basically last year, uh, where we decided to switch to Slurm. And probably the, the main, uh, main idea was to flow in the mainstream. It turns out that Slurm is now really the mainstream. The PBS, we have the, done some kind of survey across the Europe, the computing center across the, the Europe, and it turns out that all of them were having uh, slurm. There were very few other um, schedulers. This was not true a couple of years ago, so we were happy to use PBS, but now slurm is considered to be more, uh, more modern and more widespread and more flexible. And uh, we were, of course, having uh, questions from our users from across the Europe. What, why are you using PBS? It's kind of weird at the moment, everyone is using Slurm, so we have selected to, to go this direction as well. Yeah. 
We can't change it so quickly and we will not do it because we have a specialized scheduler which is doing a lot of scheduling stuff. Uh, the number of jobs we, which we have and number of jobs which are in the queue in, in, uh, in IT4I is completely different. We have uh, 10 times, uh, uh, 100 times more jobs and the scheduler must be really tuned. So I would like to say that it was not an easy switch to, to switch from Slurm. We had a lot of other technology attached to it, so it was complicated. But uh, now we have done it, we kind of, uh, the environment is more standard towards what is considered sort of standard in Europe uh, today. Uh, there is uh, Gianluca. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, yes, but uh, in the case of Barbara, there are uh, there are Intel CPUs, and uh, each socket has uh, is only one NUMA domain. So, uh, in in the case of AMD, each socket has four NUMA domains. So, mapping is more important because uh, if your application run on 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 single socket, uh, the time for reading and storing uh, uh, from or to the memory uh, of all MPI processes that run on the same socket is the same. It is not true for uh, AMD. Yes, the, the effect is very pronounced on AMD. Yeah. Uh, I s I'm afraid uh, we have to proceed. We, we are sliding a little bit behind time. So let's thank uh, on, uh, the speakers of this session one, one more time. And uh, I would like to invite uh, our colleagues, uh, Andre Philipp, Tomáš Svoboda, and uh, I think also Adrian is joining, and, uh, and, maybe, also, and maybe also Wojtek. Uh, they will be talking about or showing you some hands-on experience with big data transfers uh, via iRODS, OneData, and other technologies. I would like to stress this is an interesting topic because uh, it's, uh, it's not trivial to transfer large volumes of data into and out of the computing system. So please, uh, the floor is yours, go ahead. Yep, so hello everybody. Uh, one of the last presentation will be dedicated to data transfers and my name is uh, Adrian Rošinec. I'm from the uh, CERIT SC Center uh, within the Masaryk University and uh, uh, we heard a lot of uh, about uh, the infra CZ computing platforms and uh, we have many of them. We have many with the graphical interfaces, we have the traditional ones with the, with the PBS and, and SLARM, et cetera. So uh, we heard about the computing. So what about uh, the data storages? Uh, one of the things that uh, was mentioned maybe in the in yesterday uh, the infrastructure should be mo maybe more user uh, like closer to the users and uh, data management is one of the things that that uh, uh, maybe we are not stressing it enough and uh, we are solving uh, topics like the national data infrastructures and uh, talking about the open science and uh, fair data. So this is all the mess of some buzzwords and uh, we would like to make, uh, help you with the, with the science uh, process with tools like the One Data and iRODS. Uh, my colleagues will be talking about, about these tools in more, uh, more detailed manner. Uh, but basically uh, what these tools should do uh, is that uh, like you see, like you see this beautiful uh, something, <laughs> we call it the data management system and uh, uh, we would like uh, to address uh, some things with the data management systems. We would like to support you when you are data acquisition, uh, when, when you are in the process of the data acquisition we would like to support you with uh, accessing those data and we would like to support you with uh, moving this data closer to the compute and maybe then publishing the results uh, to the data repositories, thematic data repositories and so on. So uh, right now you will have to 
learn maybe about the SCP, FTP, and all these protocols to move data around be between uh, many platforms that the infrastructure have right now. But uh, we are testing and playing with, uh, with these tools. Maybe in the future, uh, you will be just like uh, playing with these with these tools with us and uh, moving data much easier. So this is some things that uh, I mentioned and we would like to uh, address with, uh, with one data or, or IROT systems or in general data management system. Uh, basically, we know that some of, uh, some of you, our users of the infrastructure are computing uh, in, in, the, in the Finland, in the supercomputing where we have the allocation and uh, some of our users are uh, collaborating with the scientific communities in Denmark or, or uh, Spain and uh, this is uh, quite, quite a long distance and uh, we would like to uh, bridge the gap of uh, moving the data. So, uh, yeah, so this was the, one of the examples. You have slides, so uh, let's move maybe to the, uh, to the next slide, which uh, shows the, the general data life cycle, how, how data are being, uh, uh, how data are being uh, obtained on some, on some uh, scientific instruments, uh, maybe having the console PC connected, uh, then this data should somehow travel to the central, uh, central storage system on your organization or within the infra CZ. So uh, these are uh, basically motivation why we would like to use some systems like uh, one data or IROTS. Okay, so the Thomas will be talking about the uh, one data. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Tomáš Svoboda. I am from uh, Cessnet, uh, the data department storage, and I would like to introduce you with our uh, experiences with deployment and usage of one data system. At first, some motivation. Um, we we uh, uh, started to play with one data within one project uh, which should make uh, came up with a data management solution for two cooperating cryoM facilities uh, one was in Saitec Masaryk University at uh, in Brno and one was uh, uh, at CSIC in Madrid the goals of the solution should be handover data to users transfer data to HPC resources from Brno to Madrid and vice versa and transfer data to archive storages at first, we uh, did some research among data management systems and try one data, so we uh, uh, tried this. I briefly introduced what one data is. It's a global distributed data management system. Globally means that data can be stored uh, in distant geographic localities. It is open source and on-premise. and it provides users Dropbox-like access, so uh, users are, are used to uh, use uh, this solution like Dropbox on Google Drive, so the system has quite steep learning curve. It is adapted for HPC uh, processing and it is adapted for scientific data because it's compatible or it, is, uh, it supports FAIR principles. It has several data access methods. One is a web interface. You can see uh, uh, in this picture. You can use desktop application or in automatic workflows there, you can use APR or Python lips. Uh, there are also some plugins. Uh, so data stored in one data can be used in Jupyter notebooks as uh, Lucas said few presentations ago and we are also developing Kubernetes driver to uh, smoothly import data to Kubernetes applications. The basic basic idea behind Wine Data is that 
Uh, there is a uh, spaces, it is log log logical virtual data containers, and users access the spaces in unified way because one data emulating a POSIX like file system, regardless, uh, data uh, uh, are stored on different locations and on different technologies. For, uh, for instance, this uh, space in the middle is stored in two data centers, and in each data center it is stored on different technology. But users work uh, in the same way with the data, and uh, they don't know about technologies. Uh, it provides uh, quite a fine granularity setup of data distributions. Uh, transfers between localities can be uh, on demand or on the fly when data are accessed. You can define the quality of service according some policies, policies like, uh, uh, like uh, we would like to have two copies of data in distant data centers. And the system provides overview of data transfers uh, with throughput, for example, and data distributions in uh, its uh, web interface. So now back to our CryoMA use case. We need to uh, integrate the one data system with uh, laboratory information management system. So we should uh, implement some automatic data collection from instruments, from crime microscopes. A data set discovery service was implemented. The service uh, have to, has to lo load metadata because metadata should accompany data in whole that data set life cycle, to be fair. Um, we, uh, we generate some credentials to data handover to users. It was tokens or some public URLs with a long uh, hash at the end. And transfer the data to archive uh, storages and uh, HPC processing. And there is also, also one important thing, uh, eviction of data from facility of origin when data uh, are stored in central storage because there is uh, usually only limited capacity in the facility, in the lab. Uh, how was the throughput or the performance of the system? There are two types of transfers in one data system. It is transfer between data centers, between the server parts of one data, and the transfer is quite good. It, uh, the throughput was about uh, up to five gigabits. Uh, but uh, there are second type of transfer, data center to user. And in this case, it uh, depends. User can use uh, several types of access methods. One is one client app. It uses Fuse. And uh, it was uh, much more slower. It is about uh, one gigabits. Throughput, uh, faster uh, was uh, API, was API about 2.5 gigabits, and Python FS is about uh, 1.7 gigabits. And ex expected, uh, if you have large files, you can reach large throughput, especially when you use Fuse, because it's not optimal when you have very small files. Mm. And uh, now we are establishing one data as a infrastructure service at Cessnet. So uh, there is a manage one data instance on this URL. You you can try it. Uh, it can provide optional access. So you can access by this instance to uh, object storage and work with the object storage uh, like uh, POSIX file system. And uh, we can also set up one data components in your lab or facilities to, mm, to mm, transfer data smoothly from local uh, storage to infrastructure storage. And yes, it's all from my side. Thank you. 
show our following still in the afternoon. Hello, my name is Andre Philip, and I'm from IT4I. I'm from the SCS department, and I would like to take you on a little bit journey, journey of remembering things, because definitely IRAS is a data management software, and you say again, well, I think there is place for at least two implementations in this complex world. Uh, basically, we can see that it's open source software. It has some governance by the IRS consortium, which takes care of several software packages. Some software packages are therefore with some kind of assurance. Some of those packages are just uh, plain open source uh, packages from the developers. And basically, again, we see that the IROTS offers some kinds of virtual file system, basically with unified namespace over your existing backends, NFS, I don't know, whatever, whatever backends you would come up with. It has some kind of workflow automation, which set policies and rules, which you can direct what to do with the data, data what, when to do with the data, the limits when this happens or this, it doesn't happen. Uh, of course, data discovery, also collaboration and sharing, the resource federation is available. So, so far we see that it's not, not so much different apart from the clients. There are many of those, be it APIs, be it desktop clients, and be it web interface. In that regard, I would say that uh, one data, at least from my perspective, is more com complex and uh, feature-rich client. So, there is something for IROTS to keep up st striving for. Uh, we initially came up uh, in the contact with the IROTS when doing project for DICE and especially for the b 2 safe service where we offered part of our project uh, storage service. Oh, it should be up to two petabytes. And uh, basically this was deployed as a virtual. So it was deployed in the vSphere infrastructure with some H uh, which some proxy uh, in the front end to have some HR solution. And this is where we are standing now. And okay, they are to be back. And this was used actually uh, as well for a SATEC. I believe there is <laughs> plenty for the data to, to, uh, to process. And under the umbrella of IOC, uh, this following workflow was developed. And we can see, okay, we can see right there that we, we are getting data from the microscopes, they are ingested by the Carolina or other supercomputers H84i, there is done some processing, and then IROTS push it somewhere where the client wants to have it or store it in the archive. And uh, this is not, yeah, this is basically the similar principle as was described before. And there's also something different, uh, and the situation why we are looking to have some kind of data management system to ingest our data into HPC clusters. And it all became as a little bit of story when our users complained in the, our ticket system that the transfers to Lumi are slow. But uh, that gave us a little bit pause, but how can this be? We have all these nice switches with this 100 gigs plus links and it is slow. So. We set our journey to investigate, and the first thing to note is that, that users are not racing the packets. They are no, not having some kind of speedometer and, and, and putting graphs and say, okay, now it's faster at 1% and 20%. So their, their view is more of the time of the completion, that if they feel it is slow or they feel it is fast, it's more of that. And only with the power users will get some exact data, exact measurements, Nevertheless, with the numbers which are shown, meaning that 8 to 20 megabytes per second, we were really concerned what is happening, and there, there was still some room for improvement. Uh, to understand the situation, as was already mentioned, there was recommendation about SC, SCP, SFTP, etc. We nowadays rely a lot of on the classic tools. The SCP is with us for several, several years, and it's TCP based. And we all know that TCP takes care of the, trans or the transport of the data in a reliable fashion. There needs to be some acknowledgement. I will send the data. Is it there? It's not? Okay. Let's try again, et cetera, et cetera. And there are some limiting factors which are 
which are interfering in our pursuit of, of the best bandwidth use, etc. And we are limited by this congestion window, which basically says how much data can I send before there needs to be some acknowledgement. If, if I have long way to Lumi or wherever in the world, I need this window as large as possible. And basically, it, this is dictated by the TCP buffers, but this is something which we can really tune in our data center, but if we talk about tuning it with some other people, there is another organization, and it can be quite troublesome. So we got our hands dirty. We dig into the syscontrol settings of the Linux kernel. We adjust it on our nodes or our access nodes. And there were some, some, some performance improvement. We asked our colleagues from the testnet if we can, uh, if we can get some server in different, in different location than in our DC. There were some improvement, less fluctuation, but still not something we would really be proud of. And then we get back, maybe some of you are worried, what the hell is that? It's quite a lot of text, and it's our venerable trace route command. And it clearly shows that uh, somehow, while I'm traveling from the Prague to Frankfurt, then to London, again, and then back to Frankfurt, then to Hamburg, and then to Finland, there's something going on, and some visit to London, and basically this horrifying picture for somebody which may be uh, shows us the whole way uh, our data has to transfer. And what I want you to take from this is a several colors. Uh, the blue one, well, let's say the blue one, takes care about takes care of IT4i and Cessnet. And the green one, this is Giant Network. And the yellow one is Nordunet. And F F all under the cloud is basically the Lumi. So we, we see there is quite a long way to go. And maybe we can create, uh, we, maybe we can do some shortcuts here. So let's see. Uh, there is thing that calls a round trip time. Basically, what it means if I send something and until I get the response, it's this is time is counted on. As this time is larger, there is problem for TCP to keep good throughput. Uh, we just do, did a quick comparison with the, f with the famous uh, Funet site for serving uh, Linux distributions, and we came up that why did this just 35 mi milliseconds? We need to do something. So we contacted Nordnet. After quite time, we spent uh, choosing or searching who to contact exactly at those sites. We created a ticket in the Cisnet RT ticket system and contacted to Jan to sort the routing out. So that happened after, from September to December we waited. And finally we get and something like 48 megabytes per second, which uh, let's say it's two times better, but not, not something to write home about. Evid evidently we can see the round trip time has decreased, but at what cost that happened? This, uh, this whole process took about, I don't know, a year, uh, because we, we, need, we have another, another things which were coming at us and we couldn't spare all the time just on this issue. And we came to some, some conclusions, which I named in those takeaways, which we, you or I can take away from this topic. And that is that client always wants to transfer the data in the easiest way. They don't want to fiddle with settings too much with some options and doing stuff like that. They want some application which performs from the start. And I think this is one place where those data management systems like IROTS and YData, one that, one data, sorry, can uh, really bring us something better. And the sheer bandwidth is not enough for the effective data transfer. You see, you have this 100 gig line, but you have to have the way to utilize it fully. So, also the physical distance, because the travel, the light travels through the cable and there is not, not much we can do about it. And we also had many parties involved in this, so even if it seems like a simple issue in the first, it was complicated to communicate it well. And maybe some other takeaways, uh, TCPE is not dead yet for the transfers, it's here probably to stay. 
Uh, if you have to use the link, you need some, some way to multiply your connections, to use multiple connections, be it to the one data or IROTS. Another, another solution, maybe if you have FileZilla clients, you need to set it up. And there are some emerging, let's say, I don't want to say replacements, but more something new, and which is, which is unreliable, unreliable transport with the quick protocol, which, which developed by Google is now standardized. And there are some first, first let's say, pioneering uh, pioneers, like Microsoft with the Samba over this protocol. But uh, as of today, I do not know any, let's say, HPC-ready uh, client which we would install like SSH and I can transfer those data. So we are waiting for some holy grail and it's, it hasn't happened yet. Also, you, need, you, would like, you would need to evaluate your TCP congestion regulator set, adjust your TCP buffers. And the thing is that for the local transfers, uh, SSH or SCP or FTP for that state, RSync, which uses SSH, is still enough. Only thing that you may pay attention is what uh, algorithms are using. Yeah, and I'm talking like in same same data center location. We tried some dead ends. Uh, we tried HPN SSH, but unfortunately, this is a solution which is uh, maintained by no one single developer, and uh, it would be quite problematic. UDT, which uh, seemed really a star like 10 years ago. It was uh, mentioned everywhere. Some, some, some people on Reddit say they're still using that for, the high, for, the, for these transfers, but uh, there is no, no maintenance of the software. And generally, the SFTP tuning, that uh, there were no meaningful benefits from that, even what we tried. Uh, maybe some, some short, uh, short summarization where we would want to go from there. Uh, we want to move our IROTs to bare metal deployment to have uh, all the performance we can get with direct connection to the storage. And so far, our tests show that uh, the lo locally we can utilize 100 gigabit link. 25 gigabit link is possible on Ostrava Brno. It's about three milliseconds of round trip time. And I was really hoping to have a live demo for you, live test, but unfortunately, Carolina is under maintenance and Lumi was as well. So there's something to be looking forward to where we would deploy it and test it. And there is also some, some kind of B2Safe continuation in, uh, in our pipeline. Yeah, that's, that's probably it. Thank you for, uh, for, for the audience. Thank you for our cooperation. And I would li also like to uh, thank you, Cessnet uh, DU. Uh, for the availability of the test server. I believe it was by Michal Sternat who did this user access to us. And for my colleagues who participated on, or, on this whole topic and ordeal. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, but we are, we are, although we are a little bit behind time, we are still not over with this uh, session. There is uh, still one data-related topic that we would like to relay, so uh, please uh, go ahead. Good However, afternoon. However, it's important to be concise yes, uh, yes, because we have li limited time. Briefly and quickly. Uh, my name is uh, Vojte Kubani, and I am working for the IT for Innovation in the department a user department and my presentation. Well, it, it, it's not the HyperQ presentation. The HyperQ presentation will be coming next. This is one presentation before this. Great, great. Yes, this is the correct. One. So briefly, I have to prepare uh, some demonstration about uh, maybe later. Uh, you can try uh, uh, house, uh, house homework. My name is uh, Wojciech Gubani. I am from the user support. Uh, yeah, this is. And the question is, uh, is about the uh, storage. Uh, we had um, in the morning uh, some storage uh, panel. Uh, many of things uh, was set in this panel. And uh, the question is, if it's uh, storage accessible from the cluster for IT? Yes, this. So, 
Uh, first, what is uh, necessary uh, to have it? To have uh, access, uh, it's mean uh, to have it uh, an infra account. And if you have this account, uh, you uh, must uh, fill in a uh, shortly form. Uh, after that, it's uh, after the fillings, it's uh, coming emails with uh, information uh, about your uh, credentials, uh, about your case, and, and it identificator. Uh, this information is uh, written in the uh, CESNET uh, websites. It's very well uh, rated, so I can to recommend it. And uh, uh, we have on many of kind of storages and the file system uh, in the cluster, so it's uh, necessary to know it uh, when I will to use it uh, for the copy. Uh, if I have to enough space, um, there is possible to increase the, the capacity for the projects and uh, home on the request. So it's you will be uh, copy your uh, object. Uh, you can to write that uh, you need uh, more space. And there are some limitation. Uh, everything is uh, written on the uh, documentation, IT for innovation. Uh, when I will to copy uh, the storage from from home or scratch, uh, or I will to update it, uh, upload it, uh, this uh, objects, uh, I try to, uh, to transform uh, this 10 gigabytes uh, object and this is the number, so it looks that it's very similar, and I think it's the number is very well, but I uh, believe that this was uh, on the Barbara, but on the Carolina, it will be, it will be better, the numbers, so it's an app, I think, it's one, two terabytes per hour, is download and upload is almost one terabytes per hour. And we are, have uh, installed uh, modules on Carolina and Barbola. Uh, it's used uh, on the Python uh, clients, uh, C3, CMD, and AWC. Uh, when you use it, uh, it's necessary, and if you are familiar with the clusters, it's uh, necessary to, uh, to first part is to load the, the modules, and after that it's proved that this is working. Yeah, it's very only the variety uh, contents of uh, baguette, but buckets. So I can to see it, it is working, and uh, don't hesita uh, hesitate to, to try it. And if it will be the, the problem with, please con contact us. Thank you very much. If I can summarize the last slide, basically the message is that the object storages uh, that are operated by Cessnet are available at compute nodes at Carolina and Barbara systems. And you can expect easily the speeds of uh, approximately half a gigabyte per second uh, in, in throughput. Not too bad. Uh, all right, so there were, there were some questions towards this session and uh, the question disappeared. Yeah, there was a question about uh, Fuse. Have you heard about Fuse pass-through? Do you think it could help one data Fuse client? So that was for uh, our, few, our one data colleague who, who already disappeared. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I believe at least from the Linux kernel perspective that if you use some kind of pass-through, it may speed it up, generally speaking, but Colleagues are missing to <laughs> say exactly what the situation. Okay. All right, uh, one data pass through. So, sorry, one data fuse pass through. So, if the pa if the fuse pass through feature would uh, improve the one data uh, fuse client, fuse client performance and throughput. 
Oh, yeah, as Thomas said, I don't know the exact performance numbers and, and stuff, but uh, uh, the fuse has some limitations on, uh, on this small data, when listing small data, for example. But uh, otherwise, on, on streaming the large data, it was moderately like uh, we had the slide with, with some number. I don't know mm -hmm. what was the throughput. Sorry. Good. Uh, I have one question to to one data. Uh, the performance figures that were shown there were something about five uh, gigabit uh, per second and similar. Uh, considering that we are all running hundred gigabit links these days, uh, isn't that too little? Or why? Uh, what are the bottlenecks? Can this be improved? Yeah, it uh, it uh, it could be definitely improved. It was. Uh, the unf unfortunate thing was that uh, we are running it uh, uh, in the virtual machines on the on the Brno cloud, and uh, there is uh, 10 gigs uh, limitation on the on the network level. So uh, if we are going to move it on the, on the bare metal and uh, uh, this uh, this one data components, then we will be reaching more. So what throughputs do you expect if, the, if it's bare metal? I mean, we know that for iRODs we have done some benchmarks and we know we can saturate, what was it, 80% of the 90% of the link capacity, something of that order. Can we expect something similar from the... Yeah, Thomas, do you have some for that? Uh, also the 80... 80 per, uh, uh, how much of the capacity can we saturate with the one data, basically? Of the link network. capacity, because at the moment it was very low, it was just 5 uh, gigabit. Okay, thank you very much. So let's thank all four speakers of this session. <laughs> and uh, I would like to invite the uh, last speaker, uh, Kuba Beranek, uh, who will be talking uh, about the HyperQ tool that we develop at IT. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. So, hello, my name is Kuba Beranek. I'm a PhD student. I teach and work at IT for Innovation Supercomputing Center in Ostrava. And today I would like to present you HyperQ, which is a tool that we are developing at IT for Innovations together with Adabam. But first, let's talk about clusters. And since we are at an HPC conference, let, let's talk about HPC clusters. So, how does one look like? Usually, we have a set of login nodes to which we can connect, manage our data, compile code, and so on. Then we have a set of compute nodes where we are supposed to actually compute our uh, programs. And then we have sort of a gatekeeper in the form of a system scheduler. Usually, this is either PBS or Slurm. Uh, in the rest of the talk, I will just be talking about Slurm, but everything I say about Slurm will be also true for PBS. So how does it look like when we want to actually execute something on such an HPC cluster? We SSH to the login node from our computer. We are greeted by some welcome message. And then we would like to execute something. But we cannot do it like this on the login node, because the admins would be very angry with us. They are not designed for this. So instead, we need to go through Slurm, for example. So we use sbatch. We put our computation into the queue. And this queue will be shared with many other users of the same cluster. And then we can essentially disconnect, and we just wait until we get our turn. So when we get to the front of the queue and there is enough resources, Slurm will allocate a bunch of nodes, start our computation, and that's it. So if you use HPC, you are probably quite familiar with this workflow, because it's quite, uh, I would say, common on HPC. But what's the problem with this? So uh, if we have just a few tasks, some large computations that run for hours, for example, some MPA programs, and we just put them on a few nodes of the cluster, uh, this is quite fine. Like This works with Slurm. It's, it's OK. But not all use cases look like this. For example, sometimes we might get, have a really large number of tasks that can be like embarrassingly parallel, and we want to execute these on the cluster. So usually, we won't be able to fit them in one allocation, and it would waste resources. And also, what we cannot do is this. Because if we just created a separate Slurm allocation for each task, the admins will hate you. <laughs> it, it will not work, because there is too much overhead associated with Slurm per each task. So this is not a reasonable approach. Another thing is that those tasks can be quite heterogeneous. Some tasks can be very fast, require just one CPU. Sometimes tasks can run for hours and use GPUs. And this is also challenging to map to Slurm. And if you add dependencies, so you have like a fully general task graph, 
uh, then it becomes really challenging how to map this thing to the system scheduler. And the complexity is not only in the task graphs, it's also in the hardware. So if you take a look at a single node from a cluster, this is Carolina, uh, it has 100, more than 100 cores, uh, 200 gigabytes of RAM, a bunch of GPUs, and the tasks from our workflows, they want to leverage these resources. And they are very heterogeneous, so we can have tasks with one core, with 16 cores and two GPUs, and uh, we also have some, for example, performance requirements that we want to have a bunch of cores in the same socket. So nowadays, uh, the nodes are usually divided into, into some kind of NUMA regions. So we want to be sure that, for example, our code will be running in the same region, that the CPU will be accessing memory that is close to it. And the nodes themselves are also very heterogeneous. So we can have nodes that have uh, that are CPU only. We can have nodes that are GPU accelerated. We can have FAT nodes, visualization nodes, and so on. So to sum this up, uh, if we have a complex scientific workflow with these heterogeneous nodes, nodes uh, sorry, heterogeneous resources, task dependencies, some of the tasks can fail, and we have this complex heterogeneous cluster, uh, it is not clear at all how to, how to use Slurm to deploy this kind of workflow on the cluster. So uh, the issue with Slurm and PBS is that it ties what do I want to compute, the tasks, with where should they be computed, the nodes. And in Slurm and PBS, you always submit those two things together. Right? You, you need to say, I want to compute this on this bunch of nodes. And it's always tied together. And this is very inflexible. So enter Hyperq. Uh, Hyperq is a distributed task runtime that was kind of built uh, from scratch to be optimized for HPC use cases. And its goal is to enable efficient and ergonomic task graph execution on HPC clusters. Uh, I would like to first clarify uh, one thing, just to have like a global overview of where does Hyperq fit in in this cluster image. So when you're on the cluster, there is a part at the bottom here uh, that you have the compute nodes and the system scheduler, and this is like the protected part when you need admin access to do something. And then you have the user space when you run your programs. So just to clarify, Hyperq is a normal user space program. Okay, it is something that you can run on your uh, user account and you don't need the admins to, to install anything for you. And Hyperq will then help you uh, execute your workflows on HPC easily. Uh, so if you want to use Hyperq, how can you install it? Well, it's trivial. It is a single binary. It doesn't have any dependencies. It doesn't require any administrative privileges. And it also doesn't require any configuration. So if you want to use it, you can just go to our GitHub, download an archive, extract it, and you have one binary. That's it. So what can you do with this binary? So let's go back to this example where we had the user connected to the login node, and now they will try to submit their computation using Hyperq. So first, they need to start a so-called Hyperq server. Uh, this is a sort of a management component uh, that uh, manages all the computations and the resources and does the scheduling. And the easiest way where to execute it is on the login node, because it doesn't actually use many resources, so it's fine to just run it there in the background. Uh, once you create the server, you can start submitting computations to it. So here you can see the hq submit command. It's uh, kind of similar, for example, to sbatch or qsub, and that is by design, so that is familiar to users of Slurm and PBS. Uh, when you submit your computation, your job, into Hyperq, uh, it will be just sitting there and waiting for some computational resources. Right? So notice that I have submitted something to Hyperq, but I didn't have to say where it will be computed. OK, so it is, uh, it is not defined at the same time. Uh, then I can see in the job list that there is a waiting job. OK, now there is a job in Hyperq, but I will need eventually some computational resources so that it can be computed somewhere. Uh, conceptually, I will need on some machine to run the HQ worker start command, which will start a worker, which will provide the computational resources to the server. Now, again, you can start this worker pretty much anywhere as long as it has TCP IP connectivity to the server. But usually, you will want to start it on a compute node. You can do that manually. You can start in slower allocation and start the worker. But Hyperq can make this even easier for you. So you can use the so-called automatic allocation system of Hyperq. You can say HQ alloc add slurm and add some parameters that will be used for sbatch. And you will essentially teach Hyperq how to communicate with slurm on your behalf. And then when Hyperq sees that there are some tasks that are waiting to be computed, 
it will automatically start putting Slurm allocations into the queue on your behalf. So you don't need to worry about this. What happens when the allocation gets to the front? Uh, Slurm will give you a node. HQ worker will be started on this node. It will connect to the server. Uh, then you can examine, for example, which workers are connected to that server. Well, and now you have some tasks and you have some computational resources. So HyperQ will immediately start load balancing the tasks amongst all the resources that you have available. So in this case, it will send the task to the worker, it will start executing, it will switch to some running state, so I will be able to observe what is going on. And uh, I can, at this moment, I can still add new tasks. It's, it's not tied to the worker or the allocation in any, any way, so I can just keep submitting new tasks, new jobs, new workflows, and HyperQ will make sure that it will be all load balanced. So here I have submitted a new task graph. Then when the first task is finished, HyperQ will notice that it was finished and it will start load balancing tasks from the second task graph onto the same worker, right? And if I want to, if I need more computational resources, I can start another worker. And again, HyperQ will see that there are free resources, so it will start scheduling the other tasks onto that worker. As we can see here, the workers are quite dynamic. They can kind of disappear and appear at any time. And uh, that is by design, and HyperQ is prepared for it. It is fault tolerant. So for example, if the worker crashes, all the tasks that are executing on that worker will be automatically put back into the waiting state. So there's not really much of an issue with that. OK, so now we saw how, how does this workflow look like with HyperQ. And to sum up this approach, HyperQ allows you to define what should be computed. And it allows you to provide the computational resources but it does this in a completely disentangled way. So essentially, you just say, what do you want to compute and where are the resources and let HyperQ take care about all the mapping and scheduling and load balancing. You don't need to think about it in your head. How should I create this Slurm command to map this specific task to these specific nodes? Uh, and this gives you load balancing across all available resources, nodes, and allocations. Okay. Uh, maybe you are asking, why do we need a new tool? Why cannot we just fix PBS and Slurm so that it can work with these scientific workflows, which are, I would say, quite popular to define computations these days? Uh, the issue is that Slurm and HyperQ are dealing with a very different granularity level, and Slurm has other responsibilities. For example, it needs to maintain fairness. It needs to make sure that all the users of the cluster get like fair scheduling. Uh, it needs to handle accounting so that you can, it needs to make sure that you can actually compute something, you have some kind of project, and it also handles security. So it uh, makes sure that if there are users on the same node, they are kind of isolated, and if some computation finishes, the node will be cleared for another computation and so on. So those, these tools have different responsibilities, those things are outside of scope of HyperQ, so it does not replace Slurm, but it can work, work on top of it to provide you a more ergonomic interface how to use an HPC cluster. Okay, so this was basically uh, the main idea of HyperQ, and in the rest of the talk, I will present you a bunch of features that HyperQ has, because uh, I would say it is actually quite feature-packed, it can do a lot of things, so I will try to uh, guide you about uh, various use cases that you can use it for. So, if you run HQ submit, uh, by default, it will create a single job. The job in HyperQ terminology is essentially a task graph, so some kind of directed at cyclic graph containing tasks. And in this case, a single task is essentially an execution of a bash script or of some binary program. Okay, so that's, that's a single task. Now, what if I wanted to execute more stuff? So I can create a job that contains, for example, uh, 10,000 tasks. This is called task array also in, in HyperQ. And this will create a job. It will have 10,000 tasks. And this is not an issue for HyperQ. So you can create jobs with 10,000, 100,000, even million tasks, and it will not have the same performance overhead as Slurm does. So this is, this is perfectly fine. And uh, how will the task distinguish what it should do? Well, each task will receive a separate uh, value for this environment variable. So it will know that, for example, it should work with some different input file or just handle a different part of some input directory or something like that. Uh, HyperQ also contains a lot of other like utility useful commands. So for example, this HQ progress uh, command will display an interactive progress bar so you can kind of see what is going on with your jobs and how are they progressing with the computation. 
Uh, it also contains a bunch of, I would say, shortcuts for common use cases. So some users uh, have files that have like individual lines, and they want to execute a program for each single line. So in HyperQ, you can do this with a single command. Uh, it will essentially scan the file and create a single task for each line. And then it will, again, pass the content of this line to each task through an environment variable. A common use case is also to execute something from a JSON file. So if you have a JSON file with like an array of elements, you can say uh, dash dash from JSON, and it will load the JSON array, and again, create a task for each element of that array. Now, let's talk about resources. Uh, this is actually a very powerful feature of HyperQ that it can le let you specify arbitrary resources in a very fine-grained manner. And it can do this on a bunch of levels. So first, let's start with CPU resources. Uh, here we have a node that contains eight CPUs. If I just submit uh, a computation like this, it will by default use a single CPU. But I can also use the dash dash CPUs parameter and say how many cores should this task use. So for example, if I specify that it needs four CPUs, it will create a four CPUs task. And then HyperQ will know that when it schedules and load balances this task, it will actually occupy four CPUs of this node. Then when I create, for example, four additional tasks where each of them requires two CPUs, HyperQ sees that it only has four CPUs available. So it will schedule, for example, B and C. And then later, once A is finished, it will see, oh, again, I have resources, so it will uh, continue with scheduling D and E. Okay. So we can see that the, fine, the scheduling of HyperQ doesn't work only on the level of individual nodes, but it also works on the level of very fine-grained resources, even on the, on the level of individual cores. And uh, it's not just CPU cores that uh, HyperQ can load balance. Actually, it can load balance anything. So you can define an arbitrary resource with whatever name you want, and then let HyperQ load balance it across the workers. So for example, if I define that my task needs two items of the resource foo, whatever it is, then I will need to provide a computational resource, so a worker, that will provide this resource foo. Otherwise, HyperQ won't be able to load balance it. So here I say that this worker has five, six, seven, and eight of foo, and then HyperQ will load balance the task, schedule it, uh, assign it, for example, the items five and eight, and it will also give the task this information about which items of this resource it was assigned through, again, through an environment variable. Uh, I said that the resources are, are fully general, but there are also some, let's say, specially named resources that HyperQ recognizes, and it can do some additional stuff for you to make your life easier. So, for example, if you use the resource GPU slash NVIDIA, uh, not only it will do this load balancing as I have described, but it will also, for example, set the CUDA visible devices environment for you. So by default, your task will use the correct GPUs when it is started. And the same holds for CPUs. So if I use like CPUs 4, by default, it will set OMP num threads equals 4. So your task will kind of by default use the correct CPUs that it is supposed to. Uh, if you run the worker on some node, we kind of assume that it will provide all the resources of that node. So you don't have to specify them because the worker can automatically detect them. So when you start the worker, it will detect how many CPUs it has and in how many NUMA sockets are they, how much memory it has, and also how, much, uh, how many NVIDIA and AMD GPUs are available on that worker. So it is kind of automatically detected. You don't need to specify that. Uh, we saw in uh, one of the previous uh, presentations that NUMA is very important in HPC, and of course, HyperQ knows about this, so it also has some special support for NUMA. So let's assume that we have a node that has four NUMA regions, and we want to schedule a task that requires four cores. So by default, HyperQ will try to put all the cores into the same NUMA region, but it can happen that, for example, there were already some computations going on, so in this case, it cannot find four cores in the same region. So it will just use whatever it can and just put two CPUs in the first region and two CPUs in the last region. This is because by default, it uses so-called compact mode for the CPU resource. And this tries to allocate the resources compactly in the same group. And, but if it's not possible, it will just allocate them whatever it can. If you use the strict compact mode with this exclamation mark, 
it will always allocate the things only on, on the same NUMA region. Or you can use the scatter flag. And if you say scatter, it will kind of, in the opposite direction, it will try to scatter the resources amongst different NUMA nodes. And this actually doesn't work only for, uh, not only for NUMA, but also for any resource. So you can put any of your custom resources, put them into groups, and then use these modes to allocate stuff within the same group. And uh, except for NUMA, we also, in, in, the, in addition uh, to NUMA, we also uh, heard about pinning. So HyperQ can also automatically pin the specific cores that were assigned to this task. It can automatically pin the binary that you are executing so that it will only be using this, those specific cores. And uh, in addition to these general resources, uh, it also supports some more complex use cases. So for example, you can say that some task has a time limit, and if it runs for too long, HyperQ will just cancel it because it maybe did something ro wrong or there was some bug. Uh, you can also specify a time request, and this is, again, kind of the opposite extreme. This says that the task needs to be executing for at least, for example, 10 minutes. So uh, when we are running the workers, they usually know when will they end because they start in a slurm allocation, and it has a fixed maximum wall time, right? So if there is a worker that knows that it will kind of close after five minutes, and this task needs at least 10 minutes to execute, then HyperQ will not even bother scheduling it to that worker, because otherwise it would be just waste work. It would crash in the middle, and it would need to be restarted. And HyperQ also supports uh, even uh, more, I would say, crazy uh, resource requirements. So for example, it supports fractional resources. So if you have, let's say, a GPU, and you have some program that can use a GPU, but it cannot use all the resources, like you're training some, I don't know, machine learning model, but it's not very scalable or something, you can ask for fractions of a resource. So you can say, this task needs like a half of GPU, and then HyperQ will schedule up to two tasks uh, with this requirement onto the same device. And uh, one thing that is not mentioned on the slides because it is not available in the command line interface is that HyperQ also supports uh, va resource variants. So essentially what you can say is this task requires either, for example, 16 CPUs if there is no GPU available, or if there is a GPU available, it requires a GPU and just four CPUs. Right? So you can have very dynamic, very fine-grained resources for all the tasks and let HyperQ deal with mapping them onto the hardware, the resources that you have available. Uh, one additional uh, resource requirement that it supports, and I think that's also quite unique in terms of task runtimes, is that, is that you can say that a single task requires multiple nodes. So for example, if your task runs an MPI program that needs 16 nodes, you can say dash dash node 16, and HyperQ will then essentially wait until it has at least 16 nodes free 16 workers free for this task, and then it will allocate a single task onto all of those 16 nodes. Okay, so we heard a lot about resources, but there are also other things that HyperQ can do for you. So again, in one of the previous presentations, we heard that I.O. on HPC file systems can be a problem, especially if you have a lot of small files. So what happens if I create a task array with four tasks? Uh, by default, HyperQ, if you don't override it, by default it will create a STDR and STDOut file on the file system for each task. Now for four tasks, this is actually quite okay. But what happens if you submit a million tasks? So HyperQ will handle this, there is not an issue, but uh, your file system might not handle it that well, <laughs> especially if it's uh, distributed and networked on an HPC cluster. Uh, again, the admins might not be very fond of you. So in this case, it would be bad. But what you can do with HyperQ is enable so-called IO streaming. And essentially what this will do is that the STDR and STD out of those, ta of those tasks will be streamed through the workers to the server, to TCP IP, through the network of the cluster. And the server will then write all the data into a single binary file that is written very efficiently in a sequential manner. And then it will allow you to examine this file. So it provides some comments that you can see what is in the file, what is the metadata, what is the actual content. You can use hqlog cat as an alternative of the normal cat Linux command, for example, to examine the std out of a specific task or a subset of tasks and so on. And uh, what we have seen so far was actually only the command line interface, but for many use cases, it's actually much better to use the Python API, which is offered by HyperQ. 
So it's a normal Python app package that you can install from the Python package, uh, Python package index uh, with pip. Uh, it even contains the hyperqueue logic inside. So if you use the Python API, you don't even need the binary. And essentially, it just offers you a Python API for defining jobs. So you import the package, you create a client, which is essentially the Python equivalent to the command line interfaces that, that we saw before. You create a job, you can fill the job with individual tasks. So in this case, I say that uh, I add a task that will execute some program on disk, and then you submit the job and wait for it to be computed. Now, uh, on this slide, the Python API doesn't really seem that much more useful than the command line interface, but it can do two things that the command line interface uh, is not able to do. The first is that it can execute Python functions as individual tasks. So if you don't want to write some logic in bash, if you don't want to implement a binary, you can also implement your logic in Python. Uh, like a normal Python function, you can import whatever you want, for example, TensorFlow. And then you can say, I create a task that will execute this Python function. And you can, of course, use the API to define everything else that you can do through the command line, for example, the resources. So when you use um, TensorFlow, you will probably be using some kind of GPU. And the second thing that the Python API can do for you is that you can use it to define dependencies. So this is, this is the complex case where you want to really execute some scientific workflow that has a lot of tasks that depend on each other. For example, some pre-processing, uh, I don't know, training of a machine learning model, post-processing, create some charts, and so on. And you can do this quite easily with the Python API. Uh, you can use the depths uh, parameter to specify that a task depends on other tasks, and you can create essentially an arbitrary graph with this API. And you can also combine the binary programs and bash scripts with the Python functions in whatever way you want. So you can say that, for example, the pre-processing will be a binary, then the main computation will be a Python function, and then again, the post-processing will start some script or a binary. And uh, the last feature that I wanted to demonstrate is this dashboard. So if you want to observe what is going on in your, let's say, virtual uh, Hyper-Q uh, cluster, you can use the dashboard, which, which shows, you, shows you the utilization of the workers, the status of the Hyper-Q jobs, the status of the slurm allocations, and you can kind of see everything in one place. And one, one feature, one, I would say, benefit of Hyper-Q is also that you can use it for local prototyping. So it's not very easy to deploy PBS or Slurm on your laptop, but with Hyper-Q, it's a single binary. So you can just start the server on your laptop, you can start the worker on your laptop, it doesn't require anything from the cluster, you can start submitting the tasks, and you can debug and prototype your workflow locally, and then you can just move it to the cluster, and it should essentially work in the same way. Right? Like you will have to configure the auto allocation, but that's just one command. Otherwise, it should just work in the same way. Okay, so where is Hyper-Q being used? Uh, it is used in several European uh, projects. It is also deployed and used on various HPC centers all over Europe. Of course, on IT for Innovations, but also at Lumi and a bunch of other centers. And it also has been integrated as a backend for other tools that, let's say, execute workflows like AIDA or Nextflow. And uh, as one of, let's say, concrete examples, uh, some scientists are using Hyper-Q to um, increase the hardware utilization of a workflow that is post-processing some results from experiments from uh, CERN. Okay, so to kind of sum it up, uh, Hyper-Q is a distributed task runtime that allows you to execute task graphs in a transparent way over PBS or Slurm. Uh, it provides dynamic load balancing across all resources and all allocations that you have, all cores, everything that you have available. Uh, it provides very fine-grained and complex resource management, so you can specify whatever resources you want, and it will just load balance across them. It is very scalable. Uh, it scales to hundreds of thousands of tasks and hundreds of workers. Uh, it is very easy to deploy. I think that actually may be the main benefit because uh, some task run times, and in general, software on HPC can be so painful to deploy, so this is something that we really care about. And it is also secure. It is implemented in Rust, so it won't just randomly segfault under your hands. And also, by default, it encrypts all the communication between the workers and the server, so no one will be able to listen to, to what you are submitting <laughs> uh, on, the, on the cluster. And it is also open source. So uh, if you'd like to interact with us, uh, you can go to our GitHub. 
uh, post an issue, try HyperQ out, suggest a new feature, we are very happy to uh, talk to our users. And you can find our GitHub on this QR code on the, or this link. So that's all from me. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much for introducing HyperQ to this uh, audience. Uh, we have some, we have questions for sure. So what about this isolation? I assume you mean that uh, I execute, let's say, two tasks on the same node, and I don't want them to interact with uh, other users or also my tasks. Right, so yeah, so this, I think this kind of goes, uh, okay, <laughs> it's not, uh, this goes back to the, uh, yeah, I have 180 slides, so this won't work. Uh, this goes back to the slide where I showed the, uh, the responsibilities of Slurm and HyperQ, right? So Slurm makes sure that you are not overriding those hard limits set by the cluster, and that's its responsibility. HyperQ, it doesn't really, it doesn't really protect you from this from in any way. It, it provides a virtual load balancing, and there it is your responsibility that if HyperQ gives you four cores, you somehow won't be using 16 cores in your program. Now, it tries to make it easy by default. So it sets, for example, OMP num threads. So otherwise, you like explicitly try to battle against it. Usually, by default, it will be OK. Uh, it doesn't do anything automatically for memory, but I assume there is some Linux command that you can run and say that like, if, if this pr process uses more than X amount of memory, just kill it or do some kind of hard limit. I'm not sure if this is possible without administrative rights, actually. And as I said, HyperQ runs in user space. So even, yeah, it's, it cannot protect you from the things that Slurm can protect you from. Well, C groups are uh, not user space. Yeah. So so no, this is user space. This is all user space. I, I can tell you, we would love to use C groups. <laughs> it would solve so many issues. But uh, yeah, with HyperQ is kind of designed to run in user space for good reasons. So this is something that we cannot do easily at the moment. So to say, the HyperQ is not protecting a user against himself. Yeah. Uh, there are more questions uh, that I have here. Uh, what is the benefit of HyperQ rather than submitting a job array? Uh, so. As I, as I had it in the beginning, uh, if, if you have a use case that you can solve with, a, let's say, a Slurm job array, and you are not in a situation where you are implementing your own scheduling layer on top of Slurm, which we saw uh, many times that people you say, OK, I will just use a, a job array. But what happens if half or like a bunch of the tasks fail? Then you have 10,000 10, tasks in Slurm, and 50 of them have failed. And now you need to recompute these 50 tasks. So what do you do? Well, you either need to go and manually find the tasks that failed and resubmit res them, or write some own scheduling layer that will do this for you. Well, and that's essentially HyperQ. Yeah, so it, uh, mm -hmm. this fault tolerance, I think, is quite useful, even if, you, uh, if the overhead of Slurm is not too big for your specific use case, but also the resource requirements. Like how do, how do you tell Slurm that one task needs one CPU and another task needs two GPUs and 16 CPUs? How do you do it in the same Slurm allocation? Because if you, if you just say the resource, resources for Slurm to be the maximum, then you will pay for all the resources for the whole allocation, right? Like I create a Slurm allocation for one hour that will use a GPU, and in the first half it will just use a CPU task. And in the second mm -hmm. half, it will use a GPU task. We have another two questions. Yeah. I have to step in, so please. So, uh, running such complex, uh, too many jobs uh, together is always difficult or sometimes uh, very dangerous for the whole system because it's still dependent on the user, how they allocate this flow, flow of jobs. And if one of such 
jobs will fail somehow. So after that, it can stop all others which are behind him, and uh, and it, it it will create big big uh, how to say fragmentation of the nodes because so it it will stop f from the error of that programmer I would say, and if you are running thousand of jobs behind in, in the queue, you know. So it, it can be quite difficult for the whole system. Yeah, and that's exactly why Hypercube exists, right? It, it solves this issue. Um, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I have two questions. One is very simple. It's like, uh, I know you said like it is built for the user space, uh, but uh, does Metacentrum like uh, some machines like Luna or uh, uh, Carolina, can I configure it if it is not there? Can, can I as, build as, as, as I said, I mean, you can go to GitHub, download the, the archive, extract the binary, and it works. Okay. okay. It has no dependencies. Uh, it's it's a Linux program. And the second question is like, uh, let's say I have to run the 10,000 simulations. Okay. And I have to make one script. I don't want to tree check again and again. Can I do it with the hypercube? Like, sh complete schedule of 10,000 simulations, can I do it in the hypercube? Yes. Yeah, so, as I said, you, you can use the task array, you can do like HQ submit array one to 10,000, and it will execute the same script 10,000 times, right? And then in the script, at the beginning, you will have like, if HQ task ID equals zero, do some simulation, like use it as an index into an array or something to, to do the correct simulation. So yeah, that's kind of what it is designed to do. HyperQ Hyper deployment is super simple. I'm using it on my notebook all the time just to process images or whatever. Uh, there is another question. Can we run HyperQ inside cloud and connect to Slurm uh, so that it's always available? I can answer that, yes, I have tried that. works really well. Do you want to comment? No, yeah, we, we have also tried it on some HPC cluster, uh, clusters that have a cloud partition. So we had some, some people were worried that we are running the server on the login node, so we tried to run it on the cloud partition and it works fine. We can also run the server on the compute node, like you can do an 24 hour allocation for the server on the compute node for some reason if you want, and it will just communicate with the workers on other compute nodes, so that's fine. But actually we also did some measurements, for example, we executed like 5,000 tasks over a 10 minute period, and the server on the login node ate just about five seconds of CPU time. So it really, it's, in most use cases, it is not resource intensive, so it should be fine. And the last question and final question, if you learn and use HyperQ, you may not need to learn PBS or Slurm commands. Yeah, a, a exactly. There is, I mean, you, you, need to, like, you need to know what is your computational project, so you can tell HyperQ to use like dash capital A, my project, to, to kind of get the resources from somewhere. I mean, HyperQ doesn't give you the resources for free. But yes, there is like a simple single command that you can just teach HyperQ how to communicate with your local Slurm or PBS, and then you, you don't need to worry about those systems ever again. If you will just lead, leave the scheduling and load balancing to HyperQ. I would still recommend that uh, our users understand how to use Slurm or PBS. Uh, that's always useful, but of and course, I think uh, there, yeah, is there is one, <laughs> one last question. Uh, more than last question. <laughs> So what happens if the server crashes? So currently there is no resilience for the server, so if it crashes, it will lose the, the database. Uh, usually how, how I use it, how most users use it, they connect to the login node, they start Tmax or something like that, they start the server in the background, then they disconnect from the login node and it keeps running in the background. But it is true that some users need this resilience, so we are currently implementing kind of checkpointing of the server, so maybe in a few weeks or, or months, the server should be able to kind of restart itself from a checkpoint on disk, and then it should be fine to also kill it and then get the job database back. Yeah, that's a nice, so yeah, I mean, we are trying to implement the features on a, let's say, need to have basis, so when some users come to us and they have a use case, we implement it. Uh, not actually that many users had this use case so far. They have appeared in the, let's say, this year, so we started to implement it now. So thank you very much for the discussion and for the presentation. Let's thank the speaker again.
and uh, thank uh, thank you all for uh, participation and uh, maybe if one of the directors wants to give some closing remarks i don't know just a couple of minutes before i leave to to my train so but thank you thank you very much for coming and staying here till the really end i hope that uh, you had a lot of interesting uh, presentation. Uh, you had a good time just to exchange the information uh, among the, among you and also with the with the representatives of the infrastructure. Uh, I would I would say again that actually we will be happy for any feedback from you, any suggestions uh, what uh, will be good to operate in our infrastructure. So and uh, we are really open for for such a discussion. So thank you once again, and I hope we. We will meet again. I hope uh, earlier than uh, <laughs> than uh, just uh, next year again. So, but uh, definitely uh, we will be happy to see you here again next year in the in the same conference. So, have a nice day and uh, enjoy tomorrow holidays <laughs> in uh, here in the Czech Republic.